madam we are live okay so good evening everyone uh, it's a it's my great pleasure to present this uh, webinar on behalf of hyderabad ophthalmologists association on cases of retina and uveitis and we have with us stalwarts from across the country as guest faculty dr lalit verma who's the vice president of uh, aios dr vishali gupta who's the president of uveitis society of india dr shobhit chavla who's the president of vitra retinal society of india and dr gopal pillai who's a very active uh, faculty in uh, amrita institute and is a secretary of the cochin ophthalmic club from hyderabad we have host faculty uh, luminaries dr raj narayan dr mudit tyagi dr padmaja dr raja rami reddy and dr sandeep bachu so this is how the program will be running the first talk will be by dr raj narayan and then uh, most of the other talks are surgical so i think without wasting any more time i would request dr raj narayan to speak on uh, diabetic macular edema management so um good evening everyone i thank dr malika goel and hoa for this opportunity i hope you can see my slides i'll be talking about uh, current experience in retinal therapeutics mainly related to diabetic macular edema but also i'll be talking a bit about other applications of uh, therapeutics in common diseases with respect to dme as in many many diseases we must be aware of some pivotal studies there may be 50s of studies or hundreds of studies in many diseases but it's impossible to remember the name of each study the protocol or the results to the last digit it it is extremely difficult but some of them are key studies the basic results of which we are all expected to know so that we can tell the patients what to expect with the treatment which we are giving so for diabetic macular edema for me at least the most important studies are the drcr protocol i protocol t and the mead study basically because it used steroid implant and the other two protocols were anti vegf protocols so protocol i was one of the first big studies evaluating anti vegf versus laser or intravitreal trimcinolone acetonide and uh, what was seen in that study we all knew by the time that anti vegf ranibizumab was already being used for diabetic macular edema but the key part of the study which we all came to know was about the role of laser in either improvement in vision or in reducing the number of injections if you look at this graph the deferred laser is the one in orange which is above the green one the green laser represents prompt laser prompt macular laser so surprisingly what it showed was macular laser was not effective contrary to popular beliefs it was not effective in either giving us a better improvement in vision or in reducing the number of injections so this was across the board of patients who had less vision at baseline this one is less than 65 letters or even otherwise and also patients were followed up for a long term this is the five year results again here you can see the patients who had deferred laser uh, that is beyond 16 weeks is only when they were eligible for laser and even in the deferred laser many of the patients did not receive any laser at any point of time the unfortunate thing was even the number of injections was not reduced in these categories and also uh, there was a big talk about earlier um, there was anxiety or fear of increasing macular ischemia when we repeatedly gave anti vegf injections in the eye there was an apprehension that uh, anti vegf may increase macular ischemia but that was not the case uh, based on the fluorescein angiography so that was about uh, aflibercep uh, sorry ranibizumab which was the first of the blocks for diabetic macular edema but then we also have other options including bevacizumab aflibercep and dexamethasone implant and i'll be talking about briefly about protocol t which compared the three anti vegfs which are available uh, in general sense about bevacizumab ranibizumab and aflibercep so this protocol t was the was a head to head comparison of a large number of patients 
And uh, this also uh, looked at stratifying patients at baseline with good vision at baseline versus patients who had worse vision at baseline, 2050 being the cutoff. So in general, if you look at this graph, there was not much of a difference between aflibercept, ranibizumab, and bevacizumab. But if you look at bevacizumab in comparison to aflibercept, you start seeing some differences. This is the overall picture of the entire population in the study of DME. But if you look at the population who had worse vision at baseline, that is 2050 or worse, then that's when you start seeing the difference that at least at one year, there was a difference between aflibercept and the other two antivirals. Although by year two, ranibizumab caught up with aflibercept, there was not a significant difference at year two. And you must also remember that ranibizumab used in this protocol T was 0.3 milligram, whereas normally, at least in India, there's only one dose available, which is 0.5 milligram. It was shown in the rise and right trials. They also had 0.3 and 0.5. In those trials also, they found that ranibizumab 0.5 milligram had a better outcome than 0.3, but in protocol T, it was 0.3. So overall, what you can say is that if a patient has 2050 or worse vision, that is about 612 to 618 vision, patient is in front of you, you can tell the patient that with aflibercept or ranibizumab, the patient is likely to gain anywhere between 15 to 20 letters. That's a huge amount of gain. Uh, but unfortunately, the number of injections required is uh, very high, eight to nine injections in the first year itself. That's a huge burden with anti vegf in general for all diseases. And this is the graph for patients who had a better vision at baseline, that is 612 or 69 vision at baseline. Those patients can be expected to improve by one to one and a half lines. And that's, it's all crowded over there. There's not much of a difference between any of these three anti -VEGF. So if your patient is having a good vision at baseline, it's, it's, there's no significant difference, at least in efficacy. But if it's uh, worse vision at baseline, looks like aflibercept is, has a slight edge over uh, uh, ranibizumab, maybe a little bit less over a period of two years. What about the OCT outcomes? Uh, here, the clear winner is aflibercept. It has the maximum drying capacity among all three anti -vegers. And this is across the board, not just in DME. It's true for ARMB CNVM. It's true for RVO. And aflibercept has a better drying capability than uh, the other two anti -vegers. But as I said, the injection burden is very high. While we all in practice tend to uh, kind of downgraded to as a three injection disease or three month disease. At least initially when we talk to patients, you must be very careful and tell the patient, give a, have a frank discussion that it's a long-term disease. It's not a three month disease. It's not a three injection disease. It can go on the first year and definitely a lot of patients require injections even the second year also. And that's where you are going to think about a long-term uh, implant kind of what we have with the dexamethasone implant. Uh, newer treatments are coming, including the port delivery system. You would be listening to quite a few of those talks now in ASRS about port delivery system of ranibizumab. But again, um, before that, we have this uh, dexamethasone implant, which is approved for DME as well as RBO. Uh, how does this work, dexamethasone implant? it has a mechanism of releasing three phases. The first is the surface release, where the surface gets eroded a little bit. Then there is the diffusion phase, and then the bulk erosion. You can see that the dexamethasone implant by the second month, one to two months, it starts getting eroded. And the MEAD study was the pivotal trial for um, dexamethasone implant in DME. And what it showed was patients who received a dexamethasone implant uh, had a significant improvement, at least in terms of more than or uh, equal to 10 letters, that is two line gain in vision. And also the area under the curve, which was calculated was much more than the um, sham treatment with laser. So overall DEX implant had a lot of benefit in terms of long-term sustainability. But if you look at this subgroup analysis of fakig versus pseudo fakig in the fakig group, which is the top graph, you can see that the vision starts dropping 
most likely due to cataract and once the cataract surgery is done they start gaining a little bit of vision back but if you look at the pseudophagic population the bottom graph uh, it's a sustained improvement although there are kind of a seesaw kind of effect or a short tooth effect that is because the effect of ozodex goes away the edema comes and the vision drops and then when the injection is repeated the vision comes back so but then phagic patients as we all know can develop cataract and also intraocular pressure is of a minor concern compared to intravitreal trimethylone acetonide now i will be taking through a uh, way of uh, some patient case reports how we have managed some of these patients with both anti vegf as well as dexamethasone implant this was a 51 year old gentleman who came back in 2011 so we have kind of nine year follow up data which i'll be showing and one of the reasons why i why i'm showing is that diabetic man macular edema can be an extremely chronic disease and ninth year also this patient is receiving injections it's so it's not a three month disease it's not a three injection disease uh, so this patient when he came to us he already had a history of diabetes of uh, 10 years hba1c 7.8 which is not bad considering the kind of uh, sugar levels we see in our patients sometimes hba1c of 10 11 but 7.8 can be brought down further and he did after 2 uh, years that is for the last 7 years or so his hba1c has always been around 6.5 never above 7 but initially when he came it was off the marks uh, so and he also had hyperlipidemia and his vision in the right eye was 624 2080 left eye vision was 66 but as you can see the right eye had a center involving macular edema and then the left eye had extra foveal edema and uh, we used to do fa more often in those days i can vouch that now fa has gone down significantly at least i don't do as much as fa for at baseline for all patients with diabetic retinopathy but we used to do a lot more earlier but you can see the leaking microaneurysms as well as the outer blood retinal barrier damage that is the right column you can see the late phase angiograms where you can see the diffuse leakage from the rp outer blood retinal barrier and this was the oct macular edema in the right eye and the left eye left eye is what was not center involving this patient got uh, three injections in the right eye by the time he had received three injection in the right eye the left eye also started developing macular edema center involving although the vision was 66 still in the left eye and the vision in the right eye had improved from 624 to 612 you can see the hba1c is 8.1 it's not under control and this patient after this was kind of erratic he was lost to follow up he used to travel a lot he was he was in the corporate world and systemic control is again further off the charts it's at 9% now and you can see that the edema in both eyes is worsening i am just going to summarize the right eye he had received multiple injections was lost to follow up which is not uncommon to see then he received again four uh, avastin injections that persisted now kind of and this was the story for the left eye also and we were trying to see what can be the innovations or different approaches so ppv for dme Uh, he had received intravitreal trimethylone acetonide also just excuse me uh, so uh, he had received uh, intravitreal trimethylone um, and then uh, it was it used to keep coming back again and again then he also had uh, uh, vitrectomy vitrectomy was combined with intravitreal trimethylone vitrectomy was done only for macular edema he did not have vitreo macular traction he did not have erm he did not have any other membrane so this vitrectomy was done purely for recalcitrant diabetic macular edema and in spite of that he kept on having recurrence of macular edema but one thing which i learned over that is in a vitrectomized eye don't give trimethylone they develop lots of floaters they complain too much because of the floaters it's better to give ozodex if at all you want to give but then again in spite of recurrent macular edema we did prp for macular edema so this prp was not for pdr but it was for diabetic macular edema still the patient kept on getting uh, macular edema then he received multiple ozodex now the good thing about ozodex is that it has similar pharmacokinetic pk properties 
in a vitrectomized eye as well as as it is in a non vitrectomized eye so it's still a sustained release in a vitrectomized eye he also received again anti vegf in the right eye but ultimately he always has this parafoveal edema which keeps coming to the center and then you give ozotex and it goes back so far he has received about uh, four injections of ozotex in the right eye after vitrectomy and in the left eye he has received about eight or nine ozotex injections uh, but then it did keeps going on and coming back uh, this is the last checkup he hasn't come because of covid uh, after february but you can see a lot of structural damage in the right eye and uh, the second case is about a 53 year old gentleman again he had uh, diabetic retinopathy which was stable but what story i would like to highlight is the cataract surgery how it worsens the diabetic macular edema this patient had on the first day as usual the success story of any cataract surgery 66 on day 1 but then the problem start occurring after one month or three months uh, this patient had came back with macular edema after six months received three injections of anti vegf and then it was still there he was losing vision and there was a long story of what all he received but then we decided let's try again vitrectomy with ilm peeling uh, and this patient at one year follow up had still some macular edema 618 vision but at the end of two years he got the 6-9 vision or so and he has been maintaining that but it doesn't mean that all patients improve with vitrectomy and ILM peeling uh, there is enough literature to show that anatomically patients do improve but visual gain is not much after vitrectomy but this case was an exception where the visual improvement also occurred in this patient with vitrectomy apart from um, uh, anatomical success just to switch gears and I will be concluding shortly in about two three minutes uh, the additional uh, uses of DEX implant, which we have recently published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, is another major problem of idiopathic epiretinal membrane. We all know that when, whenever we do membrane peeling for vitrectomy for ERM, you can have an increase in the edema. Embarrassingly, you see do an OCT one month after your VR surgery, the edema has increased, the patient's vision has dropped. The patient asks you, you know, I was much better before the surgery. And what we have noticed is that we, we do tend generally counsel the patient. It's a long-term process after vitrectomy. It takes six months to recover. But we wanted to see whether we can shorten the recovery period after vitrectomy. And this bottom graph is the visual acuity. This is in logmar. That's why lower the bar, better is the vision. The patient who received OZX during vitrectomy, during membrane peeling, received, uh, achieved their best vision at one month. Whereas those who did not receive OZX, their vision first worsened compared to baseline. And then over six months, it caught up. So what this is showing is that if you give OZX implant during membrane peeling, you're likely to achieve a faster recovery uh, rather than wait for six months. And then the, this is also about the gain in 15 letters, the DEX implant groups had a better improvement. OCT thickness corresponds to the visual equity. You, had a, you have a dramatic response. Uh, at one month, the edema decreases substantially, whereas if you don't do given OZX implant, you tend to have a slower response of reduction in macular edema. Even at six months, some patients have a lot of macular edema if you don't, don't give OZX. So this is just one patient comparison between the two groups. The top one is without DEX implant during vitrectomy. The edema keeps on persisting even at six months, whereas in the DEX implant one you have at one month, you are get, getting a good anatomical improvement. Another uh, new uh, use which I have seen in DEX implant in ARMD is patients who are resistant, who are resistant to anti -VEGF. You have switched anti the edema is like this. Another patient who has received so, four bevacizumab, um, one ranibizumab injects a response. So uh, this is a patient who had received four bevacizumab, one, ran, one ranibizumab, no response massive edema and this is just after a month and after six months after the injection of combination of uh, dex implant and ranibizumab it's a tremendous improvement which you can see so apart from this i would just like to show that whoever wants to give injections become medical retina specialist should get trained in injections and also uh, about their interpretation uh, uh, or decision making about uh, uh, injections so this is a cataract surgeon who is trying to give OZX injection. 
you need to be extremely careful. These are not regular injections of uh, Avastin. So this, uh, at this time, he has already touched the lens and the injection has been given into the lens. Uh, and then the FACO has been done. And along with the FACO, you can see that the Ozodex implant has also been uh, emulsified. So uh, injections, medical retina is not to be taken lightly. You must uh, get trained for them. Um, and also, um, you should uh, look at the systemic control of diabetes in all, all the pages. This is something which we all keep mentioning in any DME talk, but usually what happens is we just tell the patient control your sugar, nothing happens. We must actually actively talk to their treating physician as to what we are looking at. Unless that happens, the patients may just say that, you know, I have stopped eating rice, I'm taking my tablets every day. Uh, that's not the answer we want. So systemic control is extremely important. Thank you very much for your kind attention. This was very excellent uh, talk, Dr. Uh, Radnaray. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you know there's a lot of advantage to using uh, steroid in a pseudo fake guy. And we know from your studies that uh, these studies which you mentioned that number of injections can be much lower than anti-VEGF injections. Just three injections or two injections per year compared to nine with uh, anti-VEGF. So in a pseudo fake guy, what is your treatment of choice, first choice? Yeah, if you see the, at least the one I showed in the MEAT trial, you saw that the patients who were pseudo fake had a stable vision, but it was still not. If you need to look carefully at the graph, the y-axis, how many letters of gain did they have? That's still about seven to eight letters of visual gain. Whereas in the protocol T or any other anti vegf trial, if you look at them, at least in the combined group, you will have at least 12 to 13 letters of vision gain. And those who had worse vision at baseline of 618 or less, they used to have 18 to 20 letters of visual gain. So anti vegf always gives a much better gain in vision you may actually just use it as a support once you have reached the, you know, what you call as cruising altitude for your lift off or takeoff, you need anti -vegem. Once you reach the cruising altitude, you may support it with a DEX implant for a longer time implant. Maybe there are some cases where you have a systemic risk factor of a past history of MI or stroke, patient is pseudo fake kick, uh, you can definitely, and the patient's vision is good. I think uh, DEX implant could be a first choice also in some of those patients. Um, what would be the other indication, uh, let's say for, uh, uh, there's no systemic contraindications, but any ocular conditions where you would prefer to use a uh, steroid and not an anti-VEGF? You mean in DME? Yeah. Uh, as, as of now, as I said, uh, patients who are requiring frequent injections, like the first patient which I showed you, um, he was anyway vitrectomized. But even in the other eye, because his, his type of DME was such that if I gave anti vegf every month he would have a recurrence, kind of. I mean, you can't extend it beyond two months. While you can have treat and extend pattern, but if a patient is not tolerating an interval beyond six to eight weeks, which means you're forced to inject every four to six weeks. That's a kind of a situation where you would like to take the benefit or advantage of uh, a long acting DEX implant. I'm sure probably the PDS system of Ranibizumab also would have uh, you know, some effect in long term, but at least as of now, DEX implant is what we have for a long term stabilization. One of the ocular indications, I think, uh, for steroid where you would not like to use anti vegf would be where there is a traction in the periphery with some DME, and there is some still some active new vessels which you are treating with laser. But you want to address the DME, possibly you don't want to use anti vegf and increase the traction. So possibly there is one of the ocular indications where you may want to use a steroid. Uh, yeah, so that's one option. Uh, definitely, I like your uh, suggestion on that uh, because you anti VEGF can increase the traction, especially if it's a uh, fresh fibrovascular proliferation which is active and can contract and you know cause uh, macular TRD. In vitrectomized eyes, there is a risk of creating a retinal tear from injection of Ozodex because it may go with a lot of speed. So, is there any suggestions you can give regarding the technique of injection? 
Yeah, so um, I, I have collected some videos, at least in the ERM study, where I used to inject at the time of the surgery, do a vitrectomy, and I've recorded it, how it falls in. It does fall with some speed compared to, let's say, a non vitrectomized die, but it used to be a nice landing. So, in all of them, I used to do under visualization about 16 eyes or so. It would, it would not cause any. It's a very light implant. It's not. It's not sharp. It's. But yes, you can always uh, angulate it away from the um, from the center of the eye. You can uh, inject it a little bit in an angle so it doesn't fall on the macula. But yes, it it, it has a smooth landing. It doesn't have a problem. And anyway, it goes down and uh, lies down on the macula after the. Injection. Anybody has an, uh, something to talk about the technique of Ozodex injection to reduce the risk of retinal tears? Anyone on the panel? I think I not, Raj. Yes, sir. No, ma'am, I think there are two issues. Uh, what Raja showed beautifully is the cataract surgeon. So even when we do a combine, they have a tendency to this. They don't direct your needle, uh, their needle towards the vitreous. Similarly, like Raja already said, that it has to be under direct visualization and the needle should not be directed towards the center because the general tendency is to keep it towards the center. It should be directed inferiorly. And there is always a lot of uncut vitreous in the periphery, especially in ERMs and other macular, if you are injecting for macular edema. So it settles down very nicely into the inferior part of the vitreous. Yeah, I have injected both under air when after membrane peeling, I have done fluid air exchange and I have also injected under fluid. So fluid has more resistance. It, it doesn't it doesn't go very rapidly. Under air, it just goes rapidly. There's no resistance under air. But yes, the air cushion, the bubble is there at the end. It, it did not cause yeah, any... I have been doing this combined for ages and, you know, did a study also, which we never wrote it down, but it really works very well. During with treatment, after with treatment, with idiopathic ERMs, we started doing this when Azodex was just introduced, and I right. found it's a very rapid recovery. Yeah. Both for idiopathic ERMs and ERMs which you peel with diabetic vitrectomies, if you give an Azodex on the table, the patient is much happier after six weeks. As to a patient where you don't do. And the rebound. I wanted to just ask one question, Malika, if you permit. Yeah, please. And Dr. Vishali and Dr. Lalit, all of us in fact. Uh, when you see a patient with very poor visual acuity, if there are no financial constraints in DME, do you consider your starting with Afribercept? Has it caught on as a modality with you? Uh, when visual acuity is poor at the onset of the treatment, uh, and there are no financial or patient is fully reimbursed, uh, would you start in today's scenario your treat management with Afribercept or with some other modality? No, I do. I have patients where I've started them straight on Afribercept. And as you said, the main consideration here is the patient's uh, financial status. Um, but yes, if there are uh, if there is any patient where the edema is very very thick, uh, then aflibercept. In if I, there is no consideration of cause, then it is the drug of choice. As I showed in the OCT also, it has the best drying ability yeah. across all disease spectrum, uh, not just DM. So yes, yeah. I have patients. Uh, we just use Lucentis and aflibercept, and with the new scheme of aflibercept. Uh, both of them actually cost the same. So we don't give a vaccine, so I would. I would give, because for me, both are costing almost the same. You know why I put forward this question? Because as a patient aid program, Raja and I were planning to approach buyer, just like we have the idea for you protection program for wet AMD, we would like to have a similar one through VRSI channel with them uh, for retinologists. Absolutely. Yeah, any comments? Otherwise, we'll go to the next talk. Any any more comments from anyone? One comment was there that uh, TA7 surgeons uh, should inject with 30 gauge, but not uh, Ozodrex with 22, like they injected in the implant. 
very nice video shown by Raja. So that was in case of surgery injecting ozone drugs. What you showed, Raja? I think uh, one comment. I think one of the indications where dex implant can be also considered is a pregnant ladies with a diabetic macular edema, and uh, one important condition where injections will never give wow factor is diabetic macular edema. Not like venous occlusions where we see immediately OCT becomes flat. I think systemic control becomes very crucial though. As uh, Raja's one sentence said that don't give injections unnecessarily. I think should stabilize that and then go for the treatment as well. Ma'am, one last query to Dr. Raja uh, regarding any role of combination of uh, steroids with uh, anti-VEGF in uh, like cases like case one, what he has showed. Uh, it's a kind of a recurrent macular edema. Is there any role of combination of both together? Yeah, you see, uh, I, as Padmaja said, we have been treating patients with anti steroids and you're talking about the same time, same day injection. Yes, yes. I don't know. I haven't given as such, but I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, wow effect coming in DME. But the one I showed in AMD, you keep giving anti vegel nothing happens, and you give one other dex. Along with that, you have to give an anti vegel It just flattens. It flattens in many patients. Even today, I had one patient who just came back last month. I had given injection combination. It's a totally different field where you otherwise keep on switching, and you know you don't know. You are just playing with hope. You know, I hope this time it will work. But if you give, but I for me personally. The ARMD resistant ones are the one where we we'll tend to give on the same day. But if it's for DME or RBO, I may just uh, give OZX at one time and use the benefit of anti -VEGF. Sandeep, I used to give a lot of uh, IVTA plus uh, anti -VEGF. At that time, OZX was not there. So IVTA for the wow effect, and uh, and uh, sorry, only for the wow effect and IVTA for prolonged effect. So patients who had uh, cystic edema and SRF component, a couple of years back, I used to combine both of them. But today I don't do it because I don't think so it is really required. And one last question to Dr. Raja regarding the second Sandeep, case, what you have shown. Sandeep, one minute. Dr. Vishali, you want to be ready next because you wanted to leave? Yeah, that would be nice if I can. Dr. Dr. Sandeep's uh, comment, yeah. Yeah, regarding sure, the second sure. case, Thank you. Dr. Raja has shown uh, like ILM peeling in the macular edema, like the cystic macular edema, what you have shown on the OCT, it has got a thin roof. Like while peeling the ILM, like do you uh, encounter any kind of macular post surgery? Do you and can you repeat the question? Do you encounter any any macular holes? Macular. Holes? Yeah, because because of the thin uh, roof, you have seen you have shown a OCT. Yeah. yeah. So that's a very important question. The first thing is to peel ILM and DME is extremely difficult. I mean, it, even if you want to peel it, it won't come. It, you have to use scraper, combine it, lift, again use scraper uh, or the finesse loop. Uh, but yes, you tend, what you need to do is never pull it over the uh, center of the fovea. You may want to do a center sparing and then just trim it with the cutter at the end. But uh, at least in my cases, I've been very careful so far. Fortunately, I have not had a macular hole in DME cases. But you need to be extremely cautious. As you, as you rightly pointed out, that's something which everyone should take care of, not cause a macular hole during this. Just one contact question. Uh, uh, there is a large opening in the posterior capsule where it could come into the anterior chamber and uh, cause a uh, corneal decompensation and raised IOP. Absolutely. Right. right, we'll go on to the next talk if nobody has a comment. Uh, Dr. Vishali Gupta will be speaking on past plan of me for an unusual intermediate use like this. Thank you, Malika. And thank you, Hyderabad of Telmic Society for this kind of opportunity. My case is a 47-year-old man who comes to us decreased vision in the left eye for one year. The vision has been actually progressing and painless, and he also has metamorphopsia. He says that almost two years ago, he had some episodes of foreign body sensation and redness. He has shown at daily, actually, from where he came. He has been managed on topicals, oral steroids, not responding, 
now biologics being considered when he came for a second opinion. This, this predicted visual activity in the left eye was 660. Uh, rest was kind of normal, except when we come to slit lamp. Slit lamp showed one plus cells, one plus flare. There was some cataract, but no posterior sign AP. Vitreous showed three plus cells and there were vitreous membranes. Uh, this was the right eye, which was normal. And this was the left eye. So you can see there was a vitreous case. He was intermediate uveitis. So we kind of did what we do. We did the fluorescein right eye completely normal. And the left eye showed some leakage from the vessels uh, that can be expected in intermediate trivialitis. There was some leakage from the capillaries also, and my fellow thought it could be betrets. There was no oral or genital ulcers. And there was this huge cystoid macular edema, which you can appreciate during the late phase of angiogram. We did the OCT. Uh, this is the frame passing through the fovea. You can see there is a lot of macular edema with subfoveal serous detachment, cystic spaces, and everything. So what did we miss? Or what did the uveitis experts was previous to us miss? Because the patient has been going on for one and a half years, you know, here and there and on biologics, going to be on biologics. So the investigations are something that he was carrying with him. I'm just mentioning the relevant one because he was carrying this huge file with him that had MRI and everything. The Montius is spelled wrong, sorry. But it was normal and uh, syphilis was normal, chest was normal, ACE was okay. So, you know, there was nothing positive in the investigations. So what did we miss? If you see carefully, there are few linear, I would call it a thing right now, which are in the nasal half of the retina. About two or three of them we could see. We did not know what it was, but we could see that there were some linear shadows in the nasal half of the retina. So we go back to the retrospective history. So what he has been saying that he has on and off uh, redness and irritation in the eye. Now he comes with the history. And believe me, these uveitis patients, you really need to sit with them, talk to them if you really want to get history. He said he had a trauma to left eye with caterpillar while he was riding a motorcycle four years ago. And the hair was on the cornea and conjunctiva of the left eye, which was removed under the microscope. He is a senior bureaucrat. So at that time he was posted somewhere in Rajasthan. So he had those records where this hair was removed. And subsequently he developed intermediate uveitis two years later, but I, uh, I believe nobody correlated the two things. And, uh, that's how he ended up in a situation like this. So our final diagnosis now comes down to left eye caterpillar here induced intermediate uveitis. We did a thorough UBN 360 degree to see if there was any hair in the ciliary body before we plan any surgical intervention and there was none. So the treatment changes from steroids, from immunosuppression, from biologics and blah, blah, to simple vitrectomy. And since he also had cataract, we did a combined surgery. So this is the surgery, nothing uh, unusual. So you can see the FACO has already been done. So we go ahead, we do the vitreous. And of course, you know, we love to do flow cytos and all for many other reasons. So we took a good sample, uh, but honestly, this was more of a therapeutic where we just had to remove the hair and it did not have any diagnostic challenge. So the hair, there were three, two hair, I think. Uh, as you can see, one of it was in the vitreous, which was just cut with the help of the cutter. Uh, after the scleral indentation in the periphery, so it came out. There was another one which was lodged here, and uh, this was kind of, I just 
seized it later with the forceps, removed it from the underlying vitreous where it was kind of embedded here. I think uh, maybe, yeah. So you, I do have the video. So it was just teased off, taken out into the vitreous, yeah. And you can see, then just cut it. There was no attempt made to remove it in total because there was no diagnostic dilemma. So no point in extending the sections and doing histopathology or anything. So that's uh, the moral of the story that sometimes we get caught on with the phenotype that the patient is presenting and we don't even pay attention. So, uh, of course, we keep on doing all this crazy stuff, but there was nothing except to show on flow cytometry. There were a few B cells, few B cells mature. So when we talk of uh, caterpillar hair induced inflammation, it has five types. Type 1 is an acute anaphylactoid reaction which starts immediately and last few days with hemosis and inflammation, mostly in the conjunctiva. It can become type, which is chronic mechanical keratoconjunctivitis because the hair gets lost either in the bulb or peripheral conjunctiva and may have corneal abrasions. So I guess when he got his hair removed, it was type 1. Type 3 is formation of a grayish yellow granulomatous nodule in the conjunctiva because hair might be subconjunctival or intracorneal. And type 4 is iritis, which is secondary to hair penetration into the anterior segment. And these patients actually come with very severe iritis, nodules, and hypopion. And this is something we call of palmian nodosum because it comes with very severe inflammation. Type 5 is something which is not usual to see and which our case had as vitreo retinal involvement after hair penetration into the posterior segment. So involvement is there, just 10 to 20% hair migrates to the posterior segment to anterior chamber or sclera so it may take months or year to cause vitreitis or even endophthalmitis. And you have to remove this setae because these are the causative inflammation. So the patient, uh, we, I did keep him on steroids for some time just to give a cover. But within six weeks of the vitrectomy, he was off all medications and we he came back after four months. Now he could not come due to COVID, but his vision, he says, has significantly improved to 6'9". And he's a happy guy because he's off all the toxic drugs. So sometimes it's important uh, not to be uh, kind of get carried away by intermediate trivialitis uh, simply because uh, you are seeing a particular phenotype. And we, we, we keep on, you know, doing this wide field fluorescein, wide field ICG. So you have different toys and you like to order uh, OCTs. You see OCT or macular edema, inject Ozidex, inject, but that's not all about it. Two important things are talking to the patient and clinical examination. I think that is where we are lacking in our teaching, in our training, because it's all become so technology driven. And that is why uh, cases like these keep on hopping from place to place. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Vishali, apart from the history, is there any clinical features that, that you could guide, you know? You know, Malika, you could see the hair actually in the nasal retina, they were there. I showed they were there, but nobody paid attention because I think nobody pays attention clinically. Everybody is busy getting the fluorescence and OCT where you would not see these fine hair. But if you do a clinical examination, those hair were very much there. So you could see them clinically. Yes, so an effort has to be made to look for... Uh, I guess Can clinical I examination is no... I mean, all of us believe that it's just a courtesy to the patient doing a clinical exam and we get all the answers uh, from imaging. 
that may be true in uh, repetitive diseases like diabetes, AMD, where only thing we have to decide is whether to inject or not to inject and more of a robotic stuff. But when you are dealing with some challenging cases, I think it's the clinical examination to be, me becomes much more important than any of the imaging. Imaging is good, it's there but they do not offer anything unless you very clearly know what you are going to look for following imaging. Prashobhit, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah I sorry. want to uh, reflect upon one case, similar case which I operated about eight years back. The patient had, I want to, uh, to clarify some things with Dr. Vishali about the patient. She had a one year history of caterpillar contact, but she presented with a one month history of pain, photophobia, uveitis there was intermediate uveitis we could see the caterpillar there and we there were two breaks at six o'clock an inferior retinal detachment not involving the macula so we took her up but we encountered about nine hairs inside yeah. in the vitreous cavity we removed them all the best we could we put in silicon oil and the vision because we wanted her to have a phase with the uveitis also, and, but and we have in that uh, in the macular area because I, there was some early pucker I could see there. So we had a six nine That's visual right. acuity, yeah. and since we removed the oil, about, uh, we uh, kept oil for about six months for her because of the uveitis factor. So. Our understanding and review of literature was very low at that time. Even now, this. even now, there's nothing. But only thing is, uh, if you have a cause of inflammation in the eye and you remove the cause, you can get rid of most of the medications uh, because it's, it's his, a you. Yeah, history was there immediately. Okay. I yes, Padmaja. When uh, you are telling the case, I was just remembering in SN uh, Dr. Muna Bende once uh, yeah. UBM. Uh, in patient yeah. with intermediate yeah. yeah. they just wanted to see ciliary body any membranes and they found actually the hair and then yeah they, they reported really that so, yeah and that's they reported, why we, we did the ubm very thoroughly to were, see uh, there is were, uh, hair, hair at the paris that the cilia, that paris plant region also could have picked up and i don't know we could not pick up maybe somebody who did it wasn't this thing but we could see it clinically so in addition we did not pick up anything more than what we already could see clinically Buddha, to, dr sandeep uh, any uh, any comments Buddha? only thing is thorough yeah. evaluation during the uh, uh, vitrectomy also is very important because these are very absolutely. fine absolutely yeah. there is a chance of missing a uh, few of this inside the eye yeah so despite, uh, uh, you know, uh, wide angle system ingenuity, still you have to keep depressing, keep locating yeah. at each area so that you don't miss out on anything. Yes. I had circus which was hiding behind the iris and was being treated as uveitis for long. Finally saw the small part of it coming from behind the iris and removed Even it. Even TB granuloma, sometimes a small granuloma. Uh, in the ciliary body, they are being treated as intermediate uveitis with immunosuppression. So I think it's very important to pay attention uh, to indirect, to what you are seeing, and UBM for ciliary body region, because there may be something happening there. So Dr. Vishali, I just had one question. Is it always imperative to remove the surgery? Because we had one patient who had a history of a caterpillar injury, Subsequently, the patient had a bit of a corneal involvement, then an iritis. And then when the patient came to us from the anterior segment services, we saw one small area of a retinitis, again, nasal to the disc. And uh, just the way it penetrates through the cornea and through the ciliary body areas, it sometimes is also known to just penetrate through the retina and choroid and sclera also. So we initially gave the patient just steroids, the retinitis resolved, and now we have the patient on follow for two years. But... Uh, can that also be the scenario because we have also I, seen this I, one I would, I would guess it all depends on your uh, history, Yeah. the amount of the inflammation being induced because it comes to a foreign body. Sometimes there is a lens lying inferiorly, not doing anything, you just mm -hmm. keep it. You know, it's it can be customized. But in this patient, there were two here. One was in the yes. vitreous, other was in the vitreous base. And 
he had to be maintained on a very high dose of immunosuppression because there was P plus vitriators. So I guess we could not, we have to remove it. But yeah. if it is lying innocently somewhere in the periphery, the vision is good and there is no recurrence after you stop the steroid and yeah. there is no need for long-term immunosuppression, maybe you can get away without removing it. But honestly, I do not have much experience in caterpillar hair. I mean, no. intravitreous is not so common. So, yeah, but I, I will also, go by the scenario. Yeah, just one case yeah. we had. And we are following up this lady now, two and a half years of follow-up. No recurrence, Absolutely. but... Uh, like maybe for me, just... it would be risk-benefit mm. ratio. Yeah. What is the risk of doing vitrectomy vis-a-vis benefit of... Uh, being conservative in this case the benefit yeah. was none the risk was i mean there was more benefit of doing vitrectomy than the risk yeah. i think this case very beautifully illustrates the importance of a good history and a clinical examination absolutely more in the cases yes yeah. Yeah. The next thank question. you ma'am for this great case. thank you thank you so much dr vishali it's a very good talk thank you we invite dr lalit verma to speak on refractory macular hole I just uh, started sharing. Is it visible or? Yes, sir. Okay, I thank uh, Dr. Malika and the entire HOA for this opportunity. Uh, it's a lovely program primarily because all of us enjoy cases. And the theme Malika always puts up cases, cases, and cases, which really uh, encourages to you know participate. We all know macular surgery is today divided between peelers and non-peelers. And uh, you see this conference I had attended a couple of years back, and this was a game changer for me at least. And what was told was up to 300 microns, peeling may not be required also. And more than that, than 300 microns, you have a plethora of options. But believe me, small macular holes, uh, small in any case, we hardly get in practice. So we rarely operate on 200, 300, we get, uh, which is more than 1,000 and 50 million or so. So I still uh, peel sometimes, but more than that, uh, you see things have changed. We do a lot of flaps because, because of the size of the holes. And for me, size is not less important as compared to the morphology. You see, if the height is less and the width is more, I always do a flap. And these are my indications of doing flap, large, chronic, persistent, or myopic. I had had one uh, failure of uh, macular surgery. Haven't, uh, you see failure also is not very common. So we don't have much collection of failed macular patients also. So this is what uh, all of us uh, used to do. This is, can you see this video running? Yeah. Hi. So this, uh, you know, we used to do this scratcher, which we don't do at all nowadays. So I nowadays do direct pinch and peel. The scratcher can sometimes uh, damage the retina also. So in the peel technique, it's always uh, important to take it across. Unlike what uh, Bachu was talking that in ERMs you don't, but uh, or if the roof is thin, then you don't. But uh, here you try to peel uh, membrane uh, ILM after staining with the PBG and uh, take it RK to RK. And the results are pretty good. Thank you. And this is uh, another surgery which we do nowadays, where uh, uh, after PVD, inject this BVG dye, and then create this flap. And deliberately, as Rajan was also saying, here we put, we leave behind some crystals there, just to take care of inflammation. You see, IVT crystals are deliberately leave behind, either within the hole or outside on the surface, just to take care of inflammation. So this is the multi layered flap, which is, uh, been created and after you have done this then you uh, peel off again as much as you can from the posterior pole and the limit is generally RK to RK because uh, you see in the first go itself you should try to do rather than you know uh, have a redo done. So and after you do this then you trim it with the lowest possible suction that was 50 and then highest possible cutting that was 7000 and trim it to the size of approximately one disc or so. And uh, then you do airflow exchange and come out of it. 
so these are the results you can still see ilm uh, you know the upper photograph which is still adherent to the surface but morphology has come back this was nearly 1500 microns uh, pre operatively this was another patient of more than uh, 1100 or so reasonably okay result uh, at the end of a uh, couple of weeks so main aim was to show this video which uh, the surgery was done at our center only and uh, after the surgery the hole was 1800 microns so we had uh, we knew that various options are there people try retinal graft lens graft amniotic membrane otolocecum since we hadn't done anything so i thought we'll do ilm grafting only so this is the re surgery done in the same eye which was done at our center only here we have valve cannulas uh, in place vitectomy already had been done so there is nothing much to show here you see this large macular hole we still i still put uh, this bbg dye because i have to have a graft from uh, somewhere i did insert this chandelier hoping that i may require a bimanual uh, surgery to position this graft on the on the hole so uh, then uh, we took this uh, diamond dusted and started uh, creating this flap and once the adequate size of the flap was done then injected pfcl because you cannot cannot uh, take this graft and put it there because it will not because of the fluidics so this ilm graft has to be maneuvered under the pfcl under some heavy liquid only so this is uh, with the help of uh, diamond dusted itself so fortunately this obeyed the command of my hand and and uh, we could uh, sorry for this glitch here because did not see whether it was recording properly or not so uh, then this or you can take a non toothed forcep and maneuver it by manually so in this in this patient we just uh, glided it across very gently under the cushion of uh, perfluorocarbon liquid you see the edges of the hole are not good looking and they are slightly inverted also so uh, let me rush through this so this graft is placed over the hole still not reached this destination so still i thought that it is still not covering because the hole is very big and uh, some of the miscalculation was there so again uh, you see i thought i will have another piece of ilm from somewhere nasal retina but uh, this would not obey the command which i was wanting it to bring it there it got stuck to the to the diamond there because on the on the then i took this forceps this is a card forceps this was worse because now the ilm got stuck in between the teeth of uh, the card so i thought i'll flush it with the pfcl but it still would not serve the purpose so ultimately surgeon should know when should stop so i stopped him i will i thought i will not have another ilm so this was good enough whatever i have placed there so we still tried but uh, this was not successful so after this was done we still got a small piece uh, from the arcade so after this was done so pcl was being removed this has been done by chandelier so i learned this technique from uh, atul dhawan of chennai so this is a bbg stain visco so couple of drops being placed over that and simultaneously pfcl so that i never wanted this graft precious graft now which is still stuck there so that was uh, what i wanted to show here and this graft is still stuck there is some pfcl now what we are doing is this uh, video i saw in some egyptian conference that you take this 39 gauge uh, needle and create rd create uh, balloons in two places so that create it till the edge you would see that uh, gush of fluid coming and then do fluid air exchange taking care that you remain always nasal to the disc and don't venture into the then remove this uh, chandelier illumination 
and sutured this also because it was leaking. This was the post op result. So uh, this was another uh, small video which, if time permits, I can show. Because after this uh, lady, when I, you know, on, in all patients of retinal detachment, regardy, I always do an OCT because I don't want to be caught on the table because uh, in a bullous RD, sometimes you may miss the macular hole. So we always try and do OCT in all reg RDs also. Uh, this was the routine with tetany being done in the VR surgery. And uh, after this, I do a diathermy. And uh, the aim of doing diathermy is at this stage, after having done most of the me, is to inject PHCL so that the fluid of the posterior pole gets drained out of the hydrogen diathermy, which we have done, and hold. So now the posterior pole is flat. Because I think it is better to remove ILM in a flat retina than in a detached retina, causing less distortion to the photoreceptors and other things. So uh, then we inject BBG dye and then do this uh, usual uh, pinch and peel technique. Now I've stopped using uh, the, the uh, that, uh, diamond dusted. Diamonds are costly in any case. So this create a multi-layered flap in this patient. I just rush through it, nothing great to be shown here. So this multi-layered flap is created. And then uh, there are some PVR epidural membrane here. PVR membrane, which uh, again came out reasonably easy. So, there's nothing much to be shown in this that except that you went back and do a vitrectomy, complete vitrectomy, taking all those usual precautions that all the uh, membranes near the base have to be taken care of. This was the final removal of PFCL. Then we filled in oil in this patient. Then laser wherever you know all the break areas. This also is unnecessary that you laser 360 degrees, but in this patient we did do because of multiple breaks. And this uh, was the end of surgery, it took out uh, the cannulas and sutured the wound. And this patient did uh, reasonably well. This was the post of picture. You can see ILM flap here, pre and post being compared here. So uh, just wanted to share these two patients where uh, we did learn something in macular surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So very uh, lovely surgeries and recording is very clear, high resolution. Uh, if Shobhit Chavla or Dr. Sandeep uh, would like to speak, anything? Regarding the Sir, uh, the manipulation, yeah. Okay, one minute. Okay. So, yeah. The, the manipulation of the flap that you briefly shown in the video with the diamond dust scraper, can we also, I think we can also do with the flute tip needle by closing the uh, outside cannula and also we can use the same thing to, yeah. can you use that if you have it? Yeah. That's a good idea, but I would still prefer a forceps to be used in non tooted not the Akkad forceps, but a non tooted forceps uh, with flat blades. That should be the best kind of instrument. Flute needle accidentally, sometimes, you know, if the hand, if the index finger slightly comes on, the, the graph will be gone. So, as long as you remember that you don't have to, uh, you know, remove that finger from the from the hole, that's okay. I agree with that. That can be done. I think the biggest challenge in these surgeries is putting in the harvest, whether it is the amniotic membrane that tends to fold or the lens capsule or this. I've only tried the ILM and amniotic membrane and both have taken attempts. It's not has been a very smooth one time thing one has to you know work at it under P pfo that's the only way to do it yeah pfo is a much such situation i don't think so a lot of people have tried uh, a lot of uh, jugglery inside but without pfo this grafting anything you graft whether it's a amniotic membrane or ilm or lens capsule or 
retina tissue or choroid tissue or whatever. I tend to use a couple of drops of Helon on the graft when I have placed it and when I'm removing the PFO. I put two drops of Helon there. Correct. Yeah, that's what he has done, I think, this score. So, yeah, I am a poor man, so we use methyl cellulose only. So, I, what I did differently was uh, this I learned from again, uh, Tul Dhawan, that I put two drops of BBG dye into the syringe of Visco, and so that under air, this blue thing is visible. But you stained your retina after putting in the PFO. I normally do it before. Sandeep wanted to say something. Sandeep Pachu. Uh, thank you for showing us the excellent video, sir. I uh, want to ask regarding the technique, you don't tuck the edges of the flap for the inverted flap technique, you just leave the edges. Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, maneuver anything, I don't tuck it inside. I, they dare not touch the RP there at all okay. because the depth perception is not so great that uh, you, that is hit and try kind of stuff. Because you see, if you try to tuck it, what I do is I take this flap right to the edge, right to the edge and leave it there. I don't try to, you know, nudge it in the Edge. This is what you are asking, I think. Yes, yes, sir, yes. Sir. I do that. I don't because uh, yes. I had done this once in one lady from uh, UAE, and there was an intense pigment proliferation after a couple of months. So although the hole got closed, but the pigment proliferation, I think that was my mistake that uh, you know, I kept tugging at 360 degrees. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Great videos. Just like in answer to what Dr. Sandeep just asked, so now there are uh, papers which show that if you just place the flap over the hole instead of tucking it in, that has got better outcomes because you are disturbing the RP less like what sir said. The problem with these inverted flaps is that when you are tucking them in, there is an inadvertent risk of damaging the RP. Apart from that, even for the autologous ILM, I have tried actually all of those, the autologous ILM as well as autologous RP the free flap, the technique which was initially shown by Dr. Tamir Mahbud and Dilraj Greval. Mm -hmm. But the main problem or the main concern is the graft getting displaced sometimes. So that is one step. The last step you have to be very careful. One way of doing a fluid air exchange or a fluid gas exchange subsequently is to ensure that the tip of your cutter, I usually in these cases use a cutter to do my final fluid air exchange, is facing nasally instead of facing towards because then the chances of the graft displacement become less. And like sir left methyl cellulose, Dr. Shobhil Chavla has mentioned about use of Helon. Again, one of their advantage of using these agents is that it stabilizes the graft when you're leaving it behind. So that has been done. I actually tried using autologous serum from the patient itself. That is very easy. You just take some ML of patient's blood and the supernatant can be used. So after doing an autologous RP graft, I placed the graft on top of that. I just placed it in the hope that it is more dense. It may keep the graft in place instead of using Helon. I think that it should be Meena Chakranathi. I know she does it, but yeah. it, she does the whole blood impact. But uh, you see, unfortunately, you have to have centrifuge uh, there. Yeah. The centrifuge is a must. Otherwise, you can't separate. Uh, exactly. So I tried it in few cases. It's worked. Yeah, but yeah. again, uh, the point is that these are cases which are usually, which we tried after the conventional ILM peeling has failed. So these are like second surgeries for most of our patients. But even whole blood works. Yeah. Yeah. The whole blood is like you just draw it and put it in, or is there some processing? It is drawn by the anesthetist uh, uh, much earlier in the surgery, and then you just put one drop after you have placed your graft, or even if you are just doing uh, it's a, a repeat surgery, you can just use one drop of whole blood. It works many times. If you are not able Harvest ILM in some cases, which happens. Current holds. Okay. It works, but visual acuity, visual acuity gain may not be that good. Yeah. BBG stained visco has been pretty good. So, therefore, but I agree with you and with it that autologous blood may have additional advantage compared to visco because of the various growth factors and TGF beta or what, what whether you. Yeah, yeah. The platelet. But, uh, 
Uh, let me. Uh, there was a thesis which was done way back in 1999 where whole blood was used, serum was used. Dr. Lalit, it was under you and Dr. Dinesh Salwar that we did the, all these theses. Finally, I think the technique of our surgery has improved over the last 20 years. Yes. And our ILM peeling is now definite certain. Like in that time when we were not staining, the ILM peeling was not very very clearly uh, seen. So now it is more evident. So it is not just the blood which acts. I think a lot of other factors may play a role. And, you know, I don't think blood itself is playing a major role. What about resurgeries in which, Mudit, you are telling in resurgeries, um, if you're putting blood, autologous blood, onto resurgeries without, without autologous uh, ILM flaps from other regions, will it succeed? So, sir, I have always tried it along with an autologous ILM. My idea of using autologous blood actually initially was to Keep do it. away with the need for Helon. Yeah. Instead of Helon, okay. so what they propose is you use Helon or methyl cellulose to act as a high density material to keep the graft in place. Okay, instead of that. So, instead of that. So, I use so it I'm, along with an autologous flap. So, every time. Answer I'm your question, question, Gopal. I have done it in two cases where I could not harvest a decent ILM, very elderly patients. I could not get another ILM flap. I have just used whole blood one drop and it has succeeded. But in one patient, the visual acuity improvement was 636 initially, but after a year, it went down to counting finger. That I have not been able to figure out and the OCT picture remains the same. So Gopal, the first video I showed was a failed macular surgery and the hole was uh, 1700, uh, this thing. So I took the graft from nasal retina and put it there. And like Buddha was saying, just to ensure that graft sticks there, we use this, uh, uh, this scope. Yeah. And that is the whole uh, you know, issue in such patients. Only blood uh, I have never used, like uh, Shobha was saying. I have used only in two patients. And uh, I also did an autofluorescence study, but I could not see any factor which was responsible by her visual equity, which had gained to say. So audio issue comes. Yeah, can we go to the next talk now? Uh, if there are no more comments. Next talk is by Dr. Shobit. Shobit Chawla, yeah. He is taking the macular cases, surgery for phobia. Thank you, Hyderabad Ophthalmic Association, Dr. Raja. Uh, Hyderabad has a very special, special place in my heart. I love the city and I make it a point to be there at least two or three times a year and take morning walks around the Charminar, as you can see. So, so I'll be talking first about a case and then about my philosophy for treatment in myopic phobiosis. So this was a 30 year old patient. She came to us with a complaint. Left eye had a reasonably good visual acuity, which she was not satisfied with. There was a early PSC 612 vision. And there was myopic foveo. Right eye here of the choroidal network. It's not so bad. There was traction temporal to the from the temporal aspect here, you see. And uh, so this was the picture. And we, I am, normally don't rush into surgery in these patients. So I talked to her about the surgery. I like to document the progressive loss over time myself. And I told her to return to back to me. So she came back one year later. I had asked her to come after six months. She came one year later. Her vision was six nine, still in the right eye. And the left eye showed this more blurring of the choroidal vasculature here, as you see. And visual acuity had gone down to 636. And the OCT picture had also progressed. And she had a com combination of inner and outer schesis along with Maybe formation, definitely a lamellar hole, which could have been full thickness. So, patient, I always like to combine these surgeries with an uh, with a 
IOL and FACO. A vitrectomy, ILMP, C3F8 gas in the left eye. I use normally 10% C3F8 or 20% SF6 in these patients. In highly myopic eyes, I'm more inclined to use 10% C3F8, not the full concentration, but down to 10%. So as you see, this traction temporal to the fovea was nicely relieved. And this is my normal technique of surgery. Which I, follow in these cases. The, I do a, I not only do a fovea sparing peel, but I do fortification of the weak fovea here with four flaps. I could, it's the envelope technique as ad, advocated by Professor Hassan Mortada from Cairo. So one flap comes on top. I widen the peel, of course, to relieve all traction. As you can see, the temporal aspect had the maximal traction. So this is my second flap. So the nasal ILM has now been removed. And there was, I could see clinically the heavy traction under the microscope. I'm not much of a fan of the ingenuity. I like doing all my studies under direct visualization with the microscope. And we went ahead with this. So this is was the pre-op picture. This is one week post-operative picture because 10% C3F8 goes up from the fovea in about one week's time and you are able to get a decent OCT. And this is three weeks post-op, 618 visual. We don't need, normally don't do the vision in the first week. We record the vision after three weeks. And that's the ILM flap you see up there and a pretty good resolution. So this is an international photographic classification and grading system, which is basically based on blurring of the choroidal ves vasculature and the chorioretinal atrophy in these myopic eyes for MMT. But more significant is this classification, which is based on OCT. This is by Dr. Barbara Parolini, the inner outer matrosthesis, which is further staged than predominantly outer matrosthesis, matrosthesis detachment, and macular detachment. So these are the various subgroups which show the evolution from one stage to the other and finally macular whole stage. And a plus sign can be added to indicate additional epiretinal abnormality. This is one of my favorite comparisons, which I like to do, which is my logic for ILM peeling. That's a case on the up left is a case of X-linked foveoschesis, which is also a schesis, but nothing to do with this pathology. You see there is no ILM traction in these cases, while here the culprit is the ILM and of course the scleral ectasis, as we call it formation of staphylomas. Everybody can't do a macular buckle. It's economically and technically both challenging. So I've been following a very simple flap, do the four flap. So I like to categorize my species into a simple one where there is predominantly outer or a compound one where there's inner and outer. It's a very simple classification. And I basically this helps me decide how much of temporal peel I want to do. Uh, nasal, of course, I temporally also extend my ILM peel quite. This is a earlier of uh, an only eyed patient. Again, he had 21, 26, 36 vision. And I did a non fovea with FACO. This was his pre op picture, as you can see. And uh, he, from pre op visual acuity of oscillating between 636 and counting finger, that's what he used to be on some visit. On, I like to document a progression. I don't rush into the surgery at all. 
I got a post op with cataract surgery of twenty forty vision. So in myopic foveous cases, what I feel there is a variability of the state of the macula, the state of the chorioretinal atrophy. Combined surgery works better. History of recent progressive decrease in vision is a good prognostic marker and one of the indicators for indications for surgery for me. Peripheral retina checkup is very important, as we all know. And in the absence of macular results, I have done few cases with macular hole also and have had reasonable results. For anterior segment surgeons, it is important to rule out MMT before taking patients of disproportionate visual loss for cataract surgery, especially in myopic eyes. So thank you once again for the opportunity to present with you here. And uh, very much, Dr. Chawla, that was a good talk. Just one query. Uh, the reason why you have shifted to uh, augmenting with flaps instead of just removing the ILM, maybe fovea sparing, peeling, what was the reason to add flaps? Did you feel any there was a problem with just removing the, the flap, the ILM? It's not only fovea sparing, fovea for even if a macular hole was to form because of the dynamics, as we see in some optic pit cases, uh, the four flaps will take care of that. And uh, I've also done some cases with just air uh, and not even uh, C3F8 or SF6. And I found pretty good results. Air helps me where I'm confident that the eye will not have too much of post of hypertony. I go ahead with just a good air fill and I'm able to get an OCT the next day. Yes. And if I feel there is hypertony, I can always ask for 0.4 ml of pure SF6 just to be pushed in. So that's my technique and philosophy of surgery in myopic foveous cases. Yes. Been highly influenced both by Barbara and by Dr. Hassan Mortada, but I bent towards more towards the ILM than towards macular buckle. And why only 10% C3F8, sir? What is the role of it? And uh, instead of 20% SF6, I choose that it's a better, you know, I feel that the eye pressure on the first post-op day in highly myopic eyes, minus 18 eyes, minus 20 eyes, is better with 10% C3F8. And I do tend to put a suture on my uh, sclerotomy is in these cases. Shobit, all these gas filled eyes generally generally have. So I do 25 gauge, but I put a. All the gas filled eyes will have pressure somewhere between 10 and 15. They will yeah. never be, you know, more than 20. So. No, no. So 10 and 15 is fine. It's yeah. for a vitrectomy eye, it's fine. You so, know, when we are talking of yeah. sutures, I would just like to put here because I do a lot of primary vitrectomies as a management of uveitis instead of immunous depression. So if any one of you doing it, please, even with 27 foot sutures, because the hypotony really kills uveitis eyes with yeah. choroidals and everything. So, you know, learn a hard way, but suture always especially if there's any inflammation. This is off track, but I just wanted to. Yeah, and you get right on track, actually, right on track. So yeah. I had a question for the panel. Any experience with macular uh, buckles? Because like like Sir said, Dr. Shobhu Chawla Sir said, that he's influenced by both Dr. Baba Perilini as well as Dr. Murtada. But any experience of the group with uh, macular buckles? Dr. Padmaja has a few, I believe, but others. So uh, actually, yesterday yes, I was listening yeah. to Pradeep, who was my you know the guru for teaching macular buckle. So uh, the uh, in ASRS. So what is actually is that uh, Dr. Sobhichawla said, as he said clearly, it is a recent progressive loss of vision. For example, if we see ten cases of myopic uh, uh, detachment, probably eight cases we still go in for primary vitrectomy with ILM peeling. But those yeah. cases where category two to four, the classification where you are having extensive staphyloma on OCT or having shortening, and that case, if we learn the buckle, that's the only buckle where I use actually Chandelier, 
and uh, the technique because the t-shaped buckle is uh, available and it is cost effective and if we learn the technique and uh, first case if we learn then i think it is not a, uh, it is also a very good alternate option because when it works it works like magic so i have used in a macular hole with the posterior pole limited detachment with extensive stepheloma axial length 31 mm and we definitely need a lot of counseling with the patient also because the refractive error also will change so it's important and uh, definitely it is an option to be kept in mind in those extensive cephaloma cases as i said in 10 cases maybe in two cases you might think of doing macular buckle and i and would go for uh, 23 gauge uh, here and also posterior sclerotomies around 4 mm so that you are able to reach the macula easily and as dr vaishali said with ingenuity and all you are having extensive nice uh, visualization Uh, even on those stephalomatis the contrast so you tend to go more in favor of ilm peeling but uh, i think some cases we should try the buckle as it is it makes a lot of sense if there is a posterior stephaloma and sclera is far away from the internal lymphatic membrane you may keep on peeling anything but till the time that opposes it it will not help so as she said the advanced cases with stephaloma grade 4 5 I think buckle probably is the answer. Though I don't do it, I would love to learn it from Padmuja one day. So you could combine. Supposing your vitrectomy has not worked, yeah, combine. That would be ideal. You have to I do. Carlos, you are taking. You have to combine both. Uh, you have, have to, to combine, combine buckle with vitrectomy. Means primary yeah. buckle also will work, but but only thing is uh, the as you said, it is uh, technically it is uh, demanding the same the placement of the buckle itself, the conjunctiva. and uh, the chandelier will help us to actually visualize where we are buccal indent is going because pretty uh, because you are going in a space where there can be a posterior choroidal vessels and all those things and supra choroidal hemorrhage is a, a dangerous complication that can one should keep in mind but uh, if the surgery will take around 2 to 2 and 1/2 hours to just open the conjunctiva and keep and all but as probably you keep doing it might the speed might improve but it trick could you do it step like good buckle see how it responds if it's not and you assess that your membrane is contributing you go to feeling in the second step no yeah in my i feel oct shows action of the ilm in most of the cases even if you have a stephaloma uh, there is definite traction from the ilm in these cases you see it bridging that area And with where eyes have skisses, so I think it has to be combined with a ILMP definitely, even a buckle. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Most of the cases respond to vitrectomy. Otherwise, why would they respond just to vitrectomy? Yeah, vitrectomy? yeah. A lot true. of cases respond to it. That was my question. That Pamela, you do it only after the vitrectomy has failed, or you do a primary? No, no. I have done. A, see, I didn't do many cases. I have done two cases. One case I did with macular hole with a posterior pole detachment. it was 31 mm axial length and only macular buckle have done and it done excellent he improved from uh, even though stephaloma and all was there he improved from cf 1 meter to 20 by 125 so mm, that was good. really good and i guess was like of the stephaloma would be the most crucial thing if you can that is the main reason probably help. yeah yes. if you cannot yes. then don't do a primary this thing yes. so, so then i in one more no, it's a good idea to do a ct or an mri yeah the yeah. staff yeah. yeah. i got it yeah you know has given a beautiful classification yeah one more point about ilm peeling in this uh, macular hole with the uh, thing is that especially around the hole and also the temporal part uh, especially in, uh, the like a radial uh, thing because it's not just only the tangent the traction so if we remove the temporal ilm not just around the hole but also near the arcade temper uh, the hole tends to shorten uh, there is a theory that it can actually helps in aids in the closure and a, a last comment in fact i was i was thinking of an idea because i finding that temporal traction is maximum in these cases i was wanting to try in my next patient i don't do any peel around the hole i create a nice temporal ellipse flap and put it from the temporal side on top of the skisses i am very tempted to my mind and i have been discussing this with my fellow 
and I'm wanting to do this in the surgery still less traumatic. Obviously, if there's no big staff room. Uh, I uh, once heard this uh, uh, Dr. Mortada versus Dr. Barbara, that debate. And uh, Dr. Mortada was of opinion that ILM peeling closes yeah. it. And he feels that the rigidity of the ILM uh, on the myopic surface, that is why. Um, so we have to actually yeah. find out whether it is a you know tangential traction because of the rigidity of the ILM which is causing the problem, or is it the anteroposterior uh, you know uh, extension of the staphyloma which is causing? If it is so, how to differentiate between these two will give us an answer as to whether you should do a bacula buckle or you should do an ILM peeling first. So any ideas uh, on that? Uh, Gopal, this is what in fact the classification is about. It shows two components. A perpendicular and a tangential. Tangential yeah. by the ILM and perpendicular. But you see it till how much relieving the tangential can also counter the perpendicular extension. So, so how will you find out how much is the perpendicular component? How much is the tangential the, component? How will you find out how much is it? How yeah, much is what? That is I, I feel that I be based on anecdotal visualization of OCT, it's, I don't see any mathematical calculation for it. But so for that, sure. you have to do MRI grading. If you really want yeah. to look at the staphyloma, that you can't do on OCT. And uh, I, I don't do it as a routine, but the from Japan is published a classification where you have to do MRI Very beautiful. Right? To calculate and actually plan. Yeah. So 3D MRI progression of the staphyloma uh, anteroposterior change or something yes. like that? Yes, anteroposterior change. You can mark, you can see what is the progression, what is the posterior part, what is the inferior. You can do all that, you know, if you really want to plan it that much. In the interest of time, we'll move on to the next talk now. Dr. Rajaram Reddy on diabetic uh, spatula delamination. Well, Raja is okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Malika, for uh, giving me this opportunity. This is a talk about spatula assisted delamination and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Is a, the, I, I'll be basically talking about uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, 45 degree delamination spatula that Grisharma makes. This, is, uh, this instrument I use pretty frequently in tackling tough membrane and it uh, sort of uh, worked my manual surgery in a fair number of cases. I haven't seen many surgeons showing videos of this, so I thought it's a good thing, topic for me to do a talk on. So basically this during surgery it helps in identifying the plane and also it makes space uh, clear for the for you to introduce other instruments like cutters, scissors and as I said you can replace the manual surgery in a fair number of uh, cases. Now I'll be showing few surgeries, and uh, and I'll be. Uh, I, it's imperative to know the 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 full length of the surgery to exactly know at what stage you require this kind of instrument. So I'll be playing them in a fast forward fashion. In the case of diabetic fractal retinal detachment, there are two tough broad based membranes on uh, zero nasal and intro supra temporal and intro temporal area. They are the ones that we'll be requiring. Uh, Bachelor assisted inside out membrane. You are not seeing the video. You are not seeing the video, ma'am? No, not at all. Okay, okay. I think this is You have to again start new share. Can you see now the share? The screen. Uh, and uh, we are seeing your PowerPoint slide. You can minimize this PowerPoint slide. Probably behind that would be your video. Okay, okay. Let's just minimize this. Or cut it off because you are showing the video only, you know? Yeah. Doctor, you will have to stop your screen. Stop sharing your okay. screen. Start the video, then share the screen. Okay. 
Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. Need to share screen again, right? Yeah. Uh, with the video on your uh, desktop. Just open the video and then share the screen. Can you see now the video? No. no. Okay, I'll. Yeah. 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 This is what this is what I'll be showing from the beginning. It's sort of uh, yeah. I'll be playing with a fast forward. This is a yeah, uh, sure. diabetic PRD with a broad based uh, addition. These are the two additions that will be not moving. To handle. Yeah, temporarily. Can you speak louder, Raja? Yeah. No, video yeah, is yeah. not moving. Yeah, video is also not moving. Yeah. Video is not moving, man. Can you see the video now? Yes, stationary, stationary picture. There's okay, no more. Okay. You have to okay, play. Okay, I'll, I'll stop and share again. I think there's something wrong. You can send your videos by email to Mr. Sai. He will play it from his end. Mm, yeah, I think I can do that. Let me try again. Okay. Need to stop sharing. Ma'am, I think meanwhile uh, others can. Go to the next you, one. You can go to the next talk. I'll call. Uh, I'll do that again. Okay, yeah. Mudit, you're ready. Mudit Tiagi. Yes, I. Yes, I am. Okay, you can start with your uh, surgery for retinal detachment with ARM. Yeah. So are my slides visible? Yes. Ah. Yeah. So first of all, thanks, Dr. Malika, ma'am, and the Hyderabad Ophthalmic Association. And all the panelists for giving me this chance to speak on detachments in uh, uveitis, specifically in ARNs. Now the thing is that we all know that detachments can occur in nearly 40 to 60 percent of patients with ARN. And unlike a normal routine dermatogenous detachment, which we encounter as retinal surgeons, the problem here in ARN is that these detachments can have both a dermatogenous as well as a tractional component. And when it comes to dealing with these detachments, we need to keep certain things in mind. We need to know how these detachments differ from a routine, normal, simple ragmatogenous detachment before we start tackling them. So in the next few small video clips, I'll demonstrate how these detachments yeah. are a bit different and how we need to tackle yeah, yeah, them and yeah, what yeah. we need to do. I think. Uh... So the first point is pre-existing retinitis. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way we look at it, most of the cases of detachments in ARN occur once the lesions have healed. So these are detachments will happen in a healed ARN in which there is a peripheral necrotic retina. But in case you come across a patient who has got an active retinitis, you need to take care of that. Maybe given I usually end up giving one intravital gansaclover injection if there is an area of active retinitis. The reason is that if you start induce, doing any traction over these retinitis areas, we'll end up creating more of breaks because this retina is necrotic, inflamed, and this is a retina which is more fragile. So you'll end up creating more breaks. So you need to be careful about any pre-existing retinitis. The second is abnormal vitreous additions. The vitreous in AR and eyes is a bit different from our ragmatogenous detachments. It's more thicker. There's a higher interleukin concentration. So the vitreous over here is thicker. And if you look at this video over here, so if you see this, you see this thick sheet which is moving over here. That sheet is actually a thick band of vitreous. That is how thick these detached vitresses are and these vitresses are abnormally adherent so you see this peripheral area these peripheral areas of vitreous bands which you see over here and these membranous bands are there and you need to take care of them till you remove them you will not be able to successfully settle your detachments the third point is that again if you look at this this vitreous is extremely thick and you need to sometimes not pull it because if you pull you will end up creating more iatrogenic breaks so you end up or the ideal way is to shave them to as much you possibly and safely can. So you can go ahead with the help of a 25 gauge cutter. You can easily go underneath them and you can just truncate this vitreous, cut it as close as you can to relieve the traction. The idea is to prevent or get about or get rid of this tendency to pull at them because if you pull upon them, they are so thickly adherent, you will end up creating more breaks in the periphery. So you have to be careful while shaving these peripheral vitreous bands. That is a way it is different from other detachments. The third point is the fact that the peripheral retina is necrotic. So this is how the retina in a ARN RD might be. So you see this 
peripheral sieve like appearance we have got this detached retina and you see this entire peripheral retina this is all necrotic sieve like multiple breaks is what you see in these eyes so you have to trim remove the vitreous from it but you have to be aware of this fact now there are two ways of dealing with it either you can do a retinectomy otherwise if you even don't do a retinectomy you can just settle the retina because what happens is that there are dense fibrosis which forms so you sometimes need not do a complete retinectomy but you should be aware of this this is how the peripheral retina looks like in some of these detachments see these multiple breaks it's just like a sieve that's how these detachment eyes look like the next point is erm now that is another point which is there in these detachments in arn eyes you have got thick erms and if you do not remove the meticulously this is was the pre op ocd of one of our patients with erm and all of this thick membrane over there and if you don't remove it carefully that is one of the main reasons for recurrences which happen in these eyes the fact is that this membrane is very thickly adherent to the retinal surface sometimes we might not be able to even perceive it so now i have started post surgery staining my retina with ilm to see with brilliant blue to see if there is a thick membrane which i am missing out upon because then post operatively when you see an ocd you will see the retina is flattened but a shallow layer of fluid underneath which is still present and that is because this tort membrane is keep not allowing the retina to settle back so you have to carefully remove this so this is how see how adherent it is and you have to very carefully remove it away sometimes if you are not able to remove you might just truncate it with a cutter and that's where the 25 gauge cutter or a 27 gauge ones because they are so thin you can easily go underneath these membranes and just remove them so you try to remove as much so this is what i did this since it was so adherent i just truncated it and remove this addition over there and then you go ahead and remove these membranes so this is what i was talking about when i said that you have these flat thickly adherent membranes and till the time you remove them you will always have this contracted retina with distraction so once you remove this membrane you retina becomes more this Uh, yeah so once you just remove this membrane you will see that the retina becomes more free more bullous more mobile and that is a clue to the fact that now you have been able to achieve a removal of this membrane and the next last point is doing a laser in these eyes you have to remember that we have to do a laser in the area of the non affected or the normal retina and not in the affected one because if you do that you will end up creating more break so be careful about that do a laser 360 i end up doing a 360 degree laser after i have settled my retina under air and then subsequently you can use in just like a normal detachment surgery just remove the oil air and replace it with silicon oil the last point is recurrence now again like i said recurrence will depend upon how carefully you have or how meticulously those all the membranes have been removed in spite of it sometimes we do end up seeing recurrences and in those cases you or all of us end up using a 5000 centiscope oil and leave these eyes with a long term tamponade but for quite a few of our patient now we have been able to do a silicon oil removal and on a follow up of more than 2 to 3 years also they are doing pretty well at this point of time so that in nutshell some of the challenges which we face now these cases are different from a normal dermatogenesis detachment vitreous additions necrotic retinas and thick erms need to be addressed and the last point which actually is for all of our panel is do you all feel that there is a role for a prophylactic laser photocoagulation in arn that's a question probably for the panel personally my views are i don't really believe that prophylactic lasers help because initially when they present to us there is such a dense vitreitis that we might not be able to do a laser adequately and subsequently if the retinitis progresses and it comes to the edge of your laser marks then probably you'll end up having more breaks so i do not as a rule do a prophylactic laser but i would like to hear the opinion of our distinguished panel for this case so thank you yeah dr varma yeah. you want to answer his questions no laser i was reading a recent uh, review also laser is uh, prophylactic laser is not justified for the same reason as you said that it will create more breaks and frankly speaking the uh, entire prophylaxis will not be achieved You see, entire prophylaxis is achieved once you cover all the margin of the break of all the breaks. Yeah. That is generally not doable in this. So, hence, uh, you know, by and large, consensus is that we should not be doing prophylactic laser. It it causes more harm than good. Yeah. One of the things to yeah. remember is to avoid cryo uh, because that would cause even more thinning of the retina. Yeah. And if possible, put in a band, especially if there is inferior breaks. 
because there is expected to be traction cooperatively from the inflammation that i may agree that i may agree uh, so the point over here is i, I do one, not uh, mudit thank you I would like to ask one question from Dr. Mudit and Dr. Vichali. Yes. Sir. Uh, when AR ARN was first described long time back, there was few cases, a series of cases, which was published from Japan. Uh, that time we had treated the first few patients by vitrectomy. I am talking of 88, 89. We had treated some patients uh, with vitrectomy at uh, Shankar Netrale, and a series had come out with quadrantic. Uh, single quadrant involvement uh, ARN had been published. Do we see such cases in India? Where only, where only a single, single quadrant is single quadrant. We do see, but not very commonly. Maybe by the time they come to us, they are already progressed. But uh, predominantly, most of the cases of ARN which we see involve our larger quadrant, at least five to six clock hours, or maybe even more. Single quadrant, yeah. very rare, very unusual. Sir, it depends and on where we are picking what it up. What is your treatment protocol post surgery, and how often do you uh, see disc changes happening over the next three four months? So, so disc changes do occur. I think, in fact, one of the uh, more uh, sorry, sorry, sir, you were saying something. I interrupted. After successful vitrectomy, after successful vitreous surgery. Yes, Dr. Vishali, ma'am, you'll answer. You'll go ahead with this, or then I'll. You know, uh, vitreous surgery, by the time you do it, there is already the active phase is by and large over. Yeah. So I will not just give antiviral because I have done vitrectomy, because unlike some other forms, you don't have a risk of reactivation here in ARN. And we end up putting long-term silicon oil, which tamponades and is, you know, good enough. Uh, you really do not have to give anything additional. Disc changes do occur and uh, they do stay, but it's not a really a progressive game. So you have to take care of it in the acute phase with aspirin, with steroids, with antivirals, so that you don't end up with yeah. any of these changes. Yeah. So like I also said, most of the time, the detachments in ARN occur once the retinitis is already healed. Absolutely. So we do yeah. not need to give them any antiviral prophylaxis or antiviral treatment. Most of the time, these are already healed detach retinitis cases, maybe post three months, four months, five months. But disc changes definitely are a concern. In fact, the second most common cause of vision loss in these cases, once the retinitis has healed, is the subsequent optic atrophy which occurs apart from the detachments and that is a thing which we just have to deal with we but i want to add it. i wanted to add few points yeah number one is uh, sir asked whether it starts in one particular quadrant obviously it starts in one quadrant but no, it slowly no, no, spreads to the other quadrant starts. No? this is confined to one quadrant. yeah confined the to one is, is uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, I, guess, I guess if you oh. If you treat very early and very aggressively, probably yeah. you are preventing the progression. Correct. But these days, there is nothing like quadrantic ARN. Yeah. ARN is ARN. Yeah. Then the second thing is uh, when we say prophylactic laser, we should not be doing prophylactic laser when the patient is no. in active ARN. We should be doing that once that activity subsides and the PVD is developing and that tears are developing. That would be at the time where just that window of opportunity where a, a prophylactic laser can actually put the, uh, put the retina in place would be a very narrow time when activity is all gone and then sequelae are developing. So PVD has started, tear has started. That is a point of time when you, if you want, you can do a prophylactic laser. What is the panel's thought, thought on that? Yeah, I agree. There I is used to do. Nowadays, we honestly do not do. But we used to do it like Dr. Gopal says. But now, since the opinion is very varied and lots of people say laser really does not work. So these days, we are not doing. If at all, we just go in and do with Recme because uh, with 27 G, it's become so much easy to clear off and do everything. Yeah, so number, I will not do it casually. Number three is optic. Uh, you know, AION or ischemic optic neuropathy occurs fairly early in the disease, and probably we should give NSAIDs yeah. like aspirin to counter aspirin. it. Aspirin, aspirin has to be added very early in the course. Very the early disease. in the treatment. Number yeah. four is whenever there is a retinal detachment which is coming, the posterior pole also gets significantly shriveled and rigid. 
and uh, uh, so don't most... be late it yeah if you see the pvd is already you know vitreous adherent in the periphery and there are breaks and all so that is the stage in which instead of just doing laser it's better to go and clear the whole stuff do the barrage laser put oil because once it starts proliferating then it's very difficult yeah. so and... early intervention with 27g and with all the paraffinina that we have we do end up with a good problem with a good outcome contrary a, to the earlier yeah. times in fact that's what like what you said the posterior pole becomes a bit shriveled that is because yeah. of the fact that there is a thick membrane which forms over there until yeah. you remove that membrane yeah. the retina will still stay taut we might feel that the retina has become settled under oil but subsequently if you do an oct you will find that the retina is still a little bit marginally lifted that's because that taut membrane is preventing it from settling down Until you you know, intraoperative OCT is actually yeah. helpful yeah. in these patients a lot. I don't love it. I don't use it much, but some of these patients, intraoperative yeah. OCT, OCT is really useful. Yes, I wish we had it, ma'am, but we don't. But but no, yeah, so, I have it. But so usually most the of the times, Modit, it's yeah. it's a very hyped instrument. Most of the times, what happens? You are seeing a membrane, and you tell your fellow, okay, focus it on it. I'm seeing huh, the membrane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many times this membrane fancy. itself is quite thick and it's sheep like and it is easily removable yeah yeah once you remove it then you want to use your oct to see if there is anything still which you are because you don't want to keep on injecting can i caught in these yeah. eyes so intraoperative oct with color differentiation on ingenuity would be best because viral eyes i won't inject can i caught to identify these cases and all that stuff Post operatively, there would be a role for oral steroids to prevent uh, fraction and redetachments. I have had to give for some time in these patients oral steroids, and uh, I think that is surgeon specific. Yeah, and some I of these cases are so ischemic that NVI may also develop at yeah. at some point of time. Yeah, with silicon oil in C two, it develops. Yeah. yeah, and the oil should be five thousand so that you can five thousand uh, response. Yeah, five thousand, five thousand always. Yeah. Can we move to Dr. Raja Ram Reddy's talk now? Are you ready, Dr. Reddy? Raja, are you ready? Ready. He's not there, I think. He is there, muted. Okay. Raja, you can see the video already. Raja, yeah, we have already seen video. the video. Raja, you are muted. I think he is muted. Raja, you are muted. Raja. Not listening also. Raja means two Rajas are there. We should say Raja Ram Reddy. No, other Raja is gone. <laughs> yeah, can you start from the beginning, Doctor Raja Ram Reddy? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, I'll be showing this video about the usage of this uh, 45 degree delamination spatula uh, in management of diabetic uh, membranes. This is a case of TRD. Uh, this is a full-length video. I'll be showing in a fast-forward till we get to the point where I have to use a spatula. I hope that should be okay. Yeah. Uh, the inside-out membrane peeling, starting from the disc, is these two bridging membranes have been bridged. Inside-out membrane peel peeling has been done, and uh, while managing this. thick membranes this is where i feel this uh, uh, delamination spatula was of use for me and uh, taking out the flimsy adhesions between the membrane and the retina no yeah now again i'm fast forwarding it we can do some amount of filling with the disc with the cutter as well but sometimes it doesn't work out trying to remove it with the cutter but uh, it's not easy most of the time so this is at this point i'm using a spatula to remove the flimsy adhesion of the broad base membrane to the underlying retina and uh, Once. 
you can see that the, with the spatula we made way for that cutter to go inside and uh, once then the passage is made you can easily introduce the cutter and uh, you can rest the rest of them there Just the membranes being eaten away with the cutter. I'm doing fast forwarding of this particular place. This is another broad based, densely adhered membrane in the infrotemporal area. This would require a spatula to remove the thick adhesions uh, between the membrane and the retina. Flimsy membranes definitely can be used with the taken a can be released with the spatula, but not very thick additions. The advantage of this thing is that you can avoid a bimanual surgery, which I definitely am not a big fan of. I do end up using, but uh, you can avoid bimanual surgery in fair number of cases. You really use spatula in your technique. I'll be, I'll, there's one more video I'll share. I need to stop and start screen share again. Yeah. This is another. It is a very elegant instrument. I use it very regularly for diabetics as well as skin ears also. Okay, something is wrong. Again, the same video is being shared. Uh, no problem. We can discuss this now unless there is anything additional in that video. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, it's, I think it's open for discussion. Sir? No, like I said, uh, I also use this spatula uh, with uh, uh, in, in all diabetics and in PVRs also sometimes. And I agree that uh, it's a blunt no, with a blade which is angled, and something akin to an iris repositor only, and uh, and you use it very effectively. The beauty of the instrument is bluntness and uh, finding a plane, so that ultimately you can remove it with the cutter. It does uh, obviate by manual in a uh, whole lot of situations without much uh, damage. You see, main aim is to find a plane and do a blunt kind of dissection without uh, much damage to the underneath uh, retina. Oh, I have two more videos, but I don't think, I think there's an issue with the playing there. Sir. Yeah. I think 25 and 27 gauge cutters also kind of uh, help. It's especially yeah, yeah. 27 gauge, you can use it like a spatula, use that also to create planes. I think that has also made our life but, a little easier. Uh, when it is. Yeah, but this uh, this being a uh, blunt at 45 degrees, this can go travel a considerable length yep. behind the membrane. No, no, definitely, sir. Great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very nice use of this. After putting the spatula, you can do a horizontal movement along the you know plane of the retina. Yes. So some uh, adhesions or you know senechia there, and that also can be done with this. Now, when the 25 and the 27 cutters, since yeah. the opening has moved more closer to the tip. Now with high cut rate, probably you can shave it. But if it is very close and we are in a critical region, I have a sharp also, sharp spatula also, as well as a blunt spatula. The sharp spatula also helps significantly to find out the cleavage plane through which you can initiate the um, you know shaving. So once you have that initiation, then things will, suction will pick it up and it will go on. Don't specialize that uh, your I, uh, increase. Palpitations of those. I, I, I would like to sh sorry, sorry, share no, a technique. Yeah. If it's, uh, I've shown it to Lalit already. It's a very simple technique where you do a small, very titrated. It's a tug. It's not a pull. At the attachment of the ring at the of membranes at the disc, and just create a very minor potential space. 
and from there you insinuate your cutter and you yeah. get along yeah. but my tolerance level is very low if i feel that i am operating a patient where i could have a problem after even doing the tug i don't mind switching on to bimanual immediately i have never used the spatula i have used the dark membrane pick uh, spatula long time back which used to be there but i find this technique of tugging on the a uh, tug not a pull and just in between the disc and the surrounding and then doing a in to out dissection yeah, yeah. uh in continuing with what dr shobit is saying if you create a tug and a small little hole inside the tug you have bewelled 10000 cutters holes beautifully yeah. through a small this thing and then i use a proportional reflux to create the plate uh, and many a times it really works i actually have once used a 26 gauge needle you just bend it like you do for our rexes what that we used to call it yeah. pick when yeah, we exactly. used to do 20g so we used to bend the yeah, needles I... and do it we used to call it pick we are old now yes I remember all these things I... the problem with that particular thing is with half inch 26 gauge it will not reach and with one and a half inch it becomes a little unstable at the area yeah. where uh, you are reaching it unlike this you know, instrument the... this is very stable so i just okay. tried it once after that i went back to the cutters and i was happy with my 25 gauge cutters Actually, yeah the bevel cutters work superb in these situations see, i use uh, so the bevel allows you to go yes sandeep i use an illuminated pick so that with one hand uh, i can pick the membrane and with other hand we can use a cutter it is uh, i mean uh, alcon has this illuminated picks the illuminated pick is 23 another. or 25 gauge or 20 gauge no we have uh, 23 gauge and even 25 gauge also i use it okay 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 very nice. it is very good you can even find the membrane and you will not injure the retina we can go very close uh, no, illuminated illuminated picks are excellent excellent yeah i haven't used that new one but the whole concept we use we used to use a lot of those in 20 gauge and they were very good yeah uh, related query is uh, how many of us are still using anti vegf injection a week before surgery to prevent bleeding with evastin being out of our hands now i still use depending if there is a more vascular proliferation than the fibrous component but if it is mainly fibrous component or if it is vitreous hemorrhage or something then we don't but if the vibra- uh, uh, vascular component is predominant we still use uh, sometimes you know using rajumab Yeah, uh, that's not... what I was going to say. Some we do switch from lucentis right. to rezumab, so you know, for our pre-op patients. Yeah, yeah. One can for also use a cautery tip uh, because uh, when you cautery tip, when you use it as a for identifying the secondary membrane, it has a very good advantage. Like when you are actually doing and severing those attachment with the fine attachments, when there is a small bleeds, you can immediately cauterize also, and then you can actually do it. You're muted, Padmaja. You're muted. We can't see the video, also. Yeah, yeah. One second. Can you see the screen? Yes. So my case is a. a uh, 47 year old gentleman who came with defective vision in the left eye since 2018 he was a known retrovirus disease patient since 2005 and was an anti retroviral therapy and his cd4 count is uh, 600 he was a known hypertensive on uh, treatment when he came first initially came to me in april 2018 with the visual acuity of 2020 and 6 right eye was unremarkable except for a small area of uh, pigment alteration at the rk Otherwise, in the left eye, what we found was a giant p- 
pigment epithelial detachment in PEDs. And uh, you can see in the autofluorescence, there was a kind of a, a layering, like a, some kind of hyperfluorescence at the each PED level. And uh, in the both FFA and ICG, uh, even though component doesn't seem to be any un uh, uniformly, uh, doesn't look, it looks like serous, but uh, there was no filling of the PED or anything. It was a big dilemma. And uh, uh, we thought first it was an IPCV or, a, or uh, uh, and we did all the ICG also, we did not give any clue and whether there was any systemic history, something like any malignancy or anything like that, we did all the workup, everything was negative. And uh, then we said that these are uh, huge PEDs and you have a risk of any time something like an RP uh, rip or something can happen. And then he came in January 2020 with a visual acuity of hand movements and a giant uh, uh, the huge exudative retinal detachment and a probable site of uh, uh, RP rip and uh, the retinal detachment was just behind the lens. And uh, th then we actually uh, again did uh, the see uh, HR, whether any paraneuroplastic syndrome, HRCT, ultrasound abdomen. So the idea was that it was a bullous CSR uh, probably causing RP rip. There was no any uh, history of any uh, steroid intake or anything, and even serum cortisol levels, everything was normal, complete blood picture, peripheral blood smear, everything was normal. So I uh, uh, then we uh, I went ahead with uh, anti-chamber maintainer assisted external uh, subretinal uh, fluid drainage. So the, the in this uh, the all uh, recti were tagged and uh, the one uh, interesting uh, tip was that uh, the and you can see the retinal detachment just behind the lens and the anti-chamber maintainer to be kept in the place where you are actually planning to uh, drain the fluid. So that is the tip that one should keep in mind to prevent the possible uh, lens stitch. And uh, so once uh, the, the retinal detachment was, uh, definitely it was a very bullous. And then once uh, the fluid was uh, uh, drained, uh, I could see the retinal detachment for going back. And uh, the, the next day, what we have seen uh, is the uh, actually, the visual acuity improved in one week time, uh, 20 by 200. But the main uh, cause, whatever the culprit was, a giant RP rip, which was involving the fovea. And you can see the rolled up RP here and uh, beautifully shown in the autofluorescence as well as in FFA and ICG, and as well as in the OCT that uh, rolled up uh, RP showing a backscattering. So, a large PED uh, has a high risk of uh, transforming into RP rip and should be followed up closely. And bullous variant of CSR can be the probably the possible etiology for giant RP rip. And uh, subretinal fluid drainage can result in uh, favorable anatomical outcomes, even though functional outcome will depend on the extent of RP rip and foveal involvement. So I would like to ask panel whether anyone has come across this kind of case and then uh, what could be the still reason uh, pro pro predisposing factor for him and also what is that unusual PED in nature that we have seen initially when he came as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Padmaja, what was the, uh, I mean, how, how did you make the diagnosis of CSR? Maybe I missed the initial slides, but how did you make the diagnosis of CSR? Um, means uh, it's actually the um, it could be anything else right it could be anything else that's why we have done all sorts of uh, 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 investigations uh, and i could not come out with any reason why he was uh, having this uh, feature of giant rp rip uh, and then possible usually bullous variants of csr are known to cause uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know, X-ray. That's what I when I did the literature search, and I did all the investigations possible to rule out underlying any malignancy. In fact, even did a literature search about uh, whether there is any antiretroviral uh, drugs can cause uh, any uh, a similar picture. And his CD4 counts were always normal, and uh, he actually uh, was uh, there was no immune status uh, compromise or anything like that. And uh, diagnosis is still dilemma only what it actually caused. I am just suspecting that it could be bullous CSR, which could have caused the RP rip. And it might be idiopathic and not CSR at all. Might be. Maybe. Serum cortisol, you did? Yes. 
all possible investigations that uh, has to be done has been done actually was it a kind of nanophthalmos which can also cause exudative rd it can uh, nanophthalmos uh, because he's axial length and all were also fine and uh, that that initial presentation like that the choroid and the sclera were not thickened and uh, even that initial that it was gained pd there were ten speedies and i know that it will rupture so so but we didn't know what to do because when i did an ffa or icg we did not had any clue and normal serious speedies you will see a, a, some form of filling of the pd again fill so i was always having some suspicion that he might be having some underlying malignancy or some kind of uh, you know dump or some kind of a syro amita there is a query from the audience can it lead to redetachment after you have drained it What, did you see a redetachment and can it happen yes sir, the patient is now only 3 th uh, months follow up until now he is maintaining well and uh, we need to see the long term follow up and also other is fine there is no uh, do you need like to put him on aplirinone or something to aplirinone or something to reduce the risk of a redetachment first time though i didn't even know the diagnosis when he yeah. came with the rip and let's see you don't know Yeah, you know, and uh, I say even in CSR is not hundred percent effective. Yeah, but uh, this even angiography study did not show CSR type of. CSR. Only thing. But it could be uh, uveitis infusion sure. syndrome without nanophthalmos. Yeah. You know, you necessarily yeah. need not have nanophthalmos. Yeah. Yeah. I want to share a very interesting case where there is a pituitary adenoma. which resulted in a bilateral large csr and after the removal of the tumor this csr automatically regressed and yeah. he, she also had pigmentations all over the body which also regressed following probably it is an adrenocortical uh, stimulating hormone uh, which is produced by the pituitary i had one yeah. case of uveal bilateral uveal effusion syndrome in which uh, you, once you did i did actually external srf drainage along with uh, sclerectomy and you can you would see the leopard skin pattern type of uh, complete uh, rd in this if you see you won't see any abnormality in the underlying uh, other than that rip area you are not seeing any other uh, general abnormality in the fundus but major i think one thing that we can do probably would be a pet imaging because uh, bidum or something like that some malignancy somewhere a paraneoplastic syndrome Yeah. because you don't see any leakage we are not seeing any typical diagnosis right actually no. paraneoplastic syndrome was my first diagnosis when he even came with the giant rp rip uh, giant uh, tens pds so yeah. i actually uh, did hrct ultrasound abdomen whatever possible investigation except for pet imaging everything we have uh, done to rule out and otherwise he is pretty immuno competent even though he is a retrovirus patient his cd4 count is also 600 and uh, in find any otherwise very healthy man actually just keep under follow up with autofluorescence and you know everything yes yeah. yeah there are some other questions related to previous talks but i think we'll take them after the uh, remaining two talks so this is just for the audience to know there are some questions relating to previous talks yeah many of these cases i have I've, i also have thought of para neoplastic syndromes but there is nothing nothing found you sent to oncology bone marrow biopsy done everything done and nothing found. one important thing is many a times not the patients are on not this patient but jack inhibitors uh, jack inhibitors they can have exudative detachment and we have to keep that in mind and sometimes interferons uh these are the two things uh, jack inhibitors now more and more patient are reporting to be looking like vk but actually it's not vk so when i consulted by him oncologist they say yeah we have started using it very commonly so i think that's important so this was a different story altogether what was the inhibitors you mentioned doctor jack j e c k Jack inhibitors is one of these new drugs in hemato oncology. They are using a lot of it now. Oh, so that might be so one very important. Thing. That causes yeah, we get like those and some of the rheumatologists are also using some of these Jack inhibitors now. Yeah. Yes. So they are very common in India. I thought maybe not, but when I consulted, they, they say yes, we are using. Yeah. The so other red 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 red
Dr. Padma had already got a CBP and a yeah, she got it. Yeah, so those also can occasionally be. Can we go to the next talk with Dr. Gopal? No. Dr. Yes, ma'am. He'll be talking about infusion cannula bloopers. Yeah. So all of us, uh, all of us have spoken about very uh, significantly complex issues. I thought I will talk about some very basic stuff uh, like. Uh, uh, infusion cannula bloopers for the audience who may be, you know, starting their vitreous surgeries. So these are some uh, problems which can occur with the infusion cannula and its placement, its uh, problems. So I am what I am basically because of these teachers, Professor Tiwari, Dr. Garg, Dr. Lalit, a young Dr. Lalit here, and Dr. Dinesh Talwar, who shaped my surgical retina career in RP Center. So infusion cannula is first in and last out. This is the last man standing. It has to wither through all seasons, core vitrectomy, shave, membrane peel, hypotony, pressures, fragmentation, air fluid exchange, PFCL, all these things. Any problems here can lead to major vision threatening catastrophes. And some of the common problems are either they are not fitting, bleeding from the side, not visible, subretinal, supracoroidal, infusion suction, mismatch, slippage, etc. Now, this is a child and children's sclera is very thick and it becomes extremely difficult for the, uh, the, the troca to go in, especially if we are, so if we are not holding it properly, like uh, this is a case in which we are not holding that particular eye, supporting that particular eye, you can see how difficult it is and you can actually injure the lens or the retina, it can go actually any place. So we need to support it very well. And then with screwing movements, with screwing movements, get in uh, as much as possible. Okay, so that is difficult entry. And similar is a case in a hypotony. This is an end of thalmitis in which the choroid, the choroid and the ciliary body is thickened. I use this is like 2005, 2006 videos. And I you can see that I'm doing a biplanar entry, which probably now I would not do. I would do a probably a more vertical entry with a 25 or a 27 here. So difficult entry in a hypotony. And you can see that if it is a post-op end of thalmitis, the wound itself may gape. Now, cannula not fitting into the tubing. With a lot of uh, reuse and autoclaving and uh, repackaging, this is a problem. This is a 25-gauge infusion cannula which is placed inside, and you are using a 23-gauge uh, 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 to put it in. So if you correct it, like 25 to 25, it goes in very simple. This is a stupid, silly error, okay, because of uh, repackaging. Now, this is a very dangerous problem. You can see that uh, this infusion cannula goes inside, but it is very loose. You see, it's a time bomb. The moment you start vitrectomy, some instrument comes in, comes out, this will go, and immediately you are going to end up in a catastrophe, a choroidal detachment or something like that. Uh, the video is not playing, Dr. Gopal. Pardon me? We are not seeing the videos. We are just we are not able to see any video running. Oh, all my videos are running here actually. Yeah, we I, we thought it's going to come, but it's we are not seeing anything happening. Oh, I see. And now we can see video. Now probably yes. Why? I mean, till now you did not see any video. Oh. No. Oh, that is very strange. That is very strange. Okay, we can proceed now, at least. Now it was seen something. Yeah. So here, what happened is uh, we had an infusion cannula, which was sub, uh, sub uh, choroidal. It was removed and put in the suprotemporal uh, region. And then you are entering. You can see that there is a danger. Here we have injured the ciliary body and hyphema has come in. And this hyphema has to be removed through viscoelastic and then going inside once again. Now this, this video, can you see it's playing? No. Oh. Yes or no? No. no. Oh, no. I see. So what? this is bleeding from the cannula site. Mm -hmm. What you can do is go back and try again. Uh, we can discuss the questions from the audience meanwhile. Yeah, we'll want try that. You want to work on it? Um, I don't see why it should not play unless... Uh, Sai, can you help me with that? Sai is there? The Sai is there. Mr. Yeah, Sai? but... Uh, why, Gopal, normally you guide, guide everybody um so let me share screen again uh should i scare share the micro microsoft powerpoint presentation okay this is the screen and uh, well you can talk to sai uh, meanwhile as we do other things you can talk to him uh this video this is playing 
No, it's uh, all black actually. Okay, uh, you talk to Sai Gopal. I'll... Okay. 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 So, Dr. Sandeep, the question is: Have you purchased the illuminated pick in India or from abroad? No, it is not available in India, ma'am. So, I got it from abroad because uh, Alcon doesn't sell the illuminated picks in India. Okay, so can you guide them how to get? <laughs> I have few friends there, so I got it from there. So that's the only way to get it. Okay, then for Dr. Vishali, so Vishali has left. So anybody, I have a patient of uveitis who was operated for ERM, developed kissing choroidals, and even after drainage, the choroidals recurred. The patient got stuck during lockdown, developed a corneal ulcer, and the eye was lost. So I don't know uh, what's the question, but uh, anybody can take it. The patient did. So, if there is an active uveitis, even these eyes are a little bit predisposed to developing choroidal subsequently because of the inflammation. So, there are two or three common reasons for choroidal detachments to occur post a uveitic patient. One is an active inflammation that in itself can lead to it. Second is a very pertinent point which Dr. Vishali had mentioned in her talk that is regarding the fact that if you do not are not careful about a sclerotomy closure. Those are the eyes where you can have more of a leakage and more of a subsequent choroidal detachment. So post-operative choroidal detachment, post-uveitic eyes can be often because of uh, leakage from your sclerotomy or your port. So that has to be dealt with meticulously. The other point is obviously inflammation if there is a very active inflammation. So what was the etiology of the uveitis is also something which we have to look for. Were there any pre-existing what is there a pre-existing hypotony also because a lot of these uveitic eyes have got peripheral membranes and when these membranes contract they cause a peripheral cyclodialysis sort of a detachment over there so those ciliary detachments in itself can predispose to a hypotony so what was the underlying cause of a hypotony was there a hypotony before the surgery was also attempted or so there are multiple things which come in play so there is a complex interplay of factors specifically in uveitic hypotony eyes with uh, your case, uh, drug-induced. Yeah, exactly. Drug-induced uveitis again. Yeah. But I believe drug-induced is bilateral. So in this case, if it was unilateral, then drug-induced might be uncommon. But uh, yes. For Dr. Lalit Varma, there's a question. Would a soft tip cannula be more safe in positioning the ILM piece? Yeah, I think we discussed that soft tip cannula as long as you remember that it should not cause suction. So, uh, you know, you have to remember that uh, occasionally it does, uh, even if you, if it's an, even, especially if it's an old cannula, it may have a residual suction. So that is more atraumatic, I agree. But the best, I think, will be for suction. Yeah, so, with, uh, diabetic macular edema, would you use a combination of Ozodex and anti -vegic? So now I, you have asked me or somebody else? Anyone, anyone can. So I used to, I told you, I used to use combination of anti vegf plus uh, steroid, but now I don't use it actually. With the presence of macular ischemia, would you prefer Ozodex or anti vegf Ozodex. Ozodex. Although Ozodex. Uh, Ozodex. ischemia, if you use anti vegf there have been these studies by the new Brighter study and uh, uh, which are which are clearly shown that ischemia does not make a difference. There was a belief that anti vegf will increase ischemia, but it does not. Yeah, that's right. So I don't think there should be any difference made. Yeah, there should not be. If there are microaneurysms close to the center of fovea, would you prefer steroids? If they're causing problem, if they're causing clinically edema or center macular edema, then uh, I will actually, uh, you know, try anti vegf first. Yeah. I think anti vegf remains the treatment of choice. Yeah. Uh, irrespective of ischemia or anything else. But if they are laserable, after some time, I would tend to leave. Yeah. 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 Dr. Gopal, are you ready? Okay, I think I'll start my talk till, but he has to stop sharing. Okay. Dr. Gopal? Dr. Gopal's screen is there. Sir, your uh, video is not playing. Yeah. Video is still not playing. No. Okay. I think I'll start taking mine and then okay. we'll see this. Let me see. I think maybe you can share your videos to Sai and then again play it. Yeah, the, I have already done that. I am, I'm just sending. Yeah. Uploaded. Uh, almost all of them are uploaded. Okay. 
So I'll just show two or three cases to bring up that it's not um, always a you know, simple method. I have to use a lady who's uh, come to a macro aneurysm related bleeding. Can I order? Night show, Malika. Oh, it's okay. So this is a lady who has come with a bleed from a macro aneurysm. And you see most of the bleed is not at the center. So the center is involved, but if I try to do a pneumopexy or I do a vitrectomy and inject TPA and put her prone, the actually more blood will come into the center and she will actually lose more vision. So in this situation, um, I did laser for the macro aneurysm and then I realized that I have to remove the blood. Most of the blood is superior, but there is some at the center and vision is only counting fingers. So, uh, so this is the surgery that was done. Uh, I made a retinotomy. This is 23 gauge away from the center. And I tried to aspirate with active suction the blood, but it didn't come. So then I injected, as I'm injecting TPA, the blood is actually coming out. So I realized I have to do a positive pressure actually uh, to get the blood out instead of suction. So this is TPA being injected, 50 micrograms, followed by waiting for some time for the action of TPA to allow the clot to lyse. And then we went in again with active suction. Again, not coming out easily, but actually I used then the reflux of the foot switch to put a positive pressure in the area, very gently because it can rip off the retina there. And that was really very effective. Uh, so with this reflux and aspiration, you know, I was using them alternately to get out the subretinal blood. And because of the TPA, I think it was possible because the blood had become fluid. But it still required a lot of positive pressure rather than aspiration. And for the remaining part of the, I used aspiration to remove the thick clots after the liquid blood had been removed. And with the vitrector, these clots were eaten away. So that the center, if you see now, has become quite clear of blood. And then just treated with air exchange and laser. And you see post-operatively with silicon oil because it was a large retinotomy. So there's no blood at the center now. And this is after removing the oil, she is six by six. Similarly, a gentleman with one eye only, this is the left eye which is really working, right is poor. He has some kind of uh, retinal degeneration. And he came to me just two months back with sudden vision loss. Um, I'm assuming this is ARMD or, but I don't know what's the cause. Now, I, again here, the, he's able to still see, use his paracentral area. If I use pneumopexy, he might lose even that. And this is one eye. And he's an HIV positive patient with multiple uh, financial problems. So I could have done the same surgery to remove the blood. But in the lockdown time, I didn't want to take a risk with complications. So I decided not to use gas to remove the central blood, but just give an anti-VEGF for the underlying disease, which was most likely CNVM. This was the condition that the blood was bisecting the center. And inferiorly, there was a lot of blood with a PED. So I just gave him an anti vegf injection. And uh, you can see that at one month, vision has improved from CFCF to 636, and he's much happier. So, and the blood is now a little bit away from the center and much less. Inferiorly, also, it has resolved. And this is a lady with Tursen syndrome, subarachnoid hemorrhage with bilateral. Uh, retinal hemorrhages and subretinal hemorrhages as well. So I was surprised to know that tersin can cause submacular hemorrhages. I just thought they used to cause only retinal hemorrhages or vitreous hemorrhages. So in this uh, eye, right eye, uh, this was a large subretinal bleed also. We gave her a TPA, intravitreal TPA with gas and put her prone. She was very uncooperative from her central uh, CNS condition. So I could not inject the left eye because she was not cooperating. And the right eye improved very well with TPA and gas, prone position. The left eye, I decided to take her up after five days. But by this time, you can see the blood has organized. It's becoming yellow and the liquid heme has resolved. Anyway, I thought I'll give just gas and prone position, but TPA was not given for this eye. And so this eye has not resolved to the same, vision recovery has not been to the same extent 
as the right eye which actually had more blood subretinal blood at the time of injection so in this case i think the left eye what i learned the lesson was probably we should have injected the same day both eyes even though she was uncooperative and uh, tpa should have been added probably in the left eye might have improved the result thank you excellent uh, malika the the first uh, video was too good actually you see where uh, that uh, you had a alternate reflux as well as active respiration the result was very very good and the video also was very very nice somehow uh, somehow i have not uh, have very good results with tpa because whether submacular hemorrhage whether i use tpa or not in a long follow up by and large is similar so maybe uh, you mean subretinal or you mean intravitreal sir no subretinal or intravitreal both you see they have not helped me in a great way wherever i have not used then also results have been in a long follow up reasonably good and uh, in case i have used them also then also because the what i depend more is on you know, pneumoretinopexy pneumopexy right. plus injection and something this is pneumopexy would be more harmful because you would be displacing the blood into the center no in this situation is okay but i am generally talking of tpa for so some situation i wanted to know if anybody would uh, do anything differently than yeah pneumopexy. very differently i do a lot of these cases if the blood is more than 1000 micron height uh, at the fovea whether it's a case of macroaneurysm or pcv and i go ahead with a vitrectomy i in macro aneurysm i do an ilm peel at the same time get the blood out of the sub ilm compartment then you have the sub retinal blood there i do a 25 microgram injection of tpa sub retinal 25 microgram in the vitreous cavity a small air bubble underneath and i don't wait at all i just put in 20% sf6 position the patient and i go back after 3 days then i do my definitive surgery and have had excellent results if it's a pcv i combine that there is a pre op ilia injection and there is a intra op second injection as soon as i've completed the surgery uh, in the bare vitreous cavity and i have had very good results i have a big series now and i follow this protocol routinely i've yeah, shown yeah. Uh, So I've seen some of my cases. No, are you and applying this to the situation where the center is still preserved, relatively preserved? Yes, because because once you have injected, that blood will be liquefied. You have to explain the patient the fact about a second surgery and go ahead with it. You will not find anything at the fovea. Your scare of that blood shifting to the fovea uh, will not be there. So in the second surgery, you will be removing the blood, is it? You will not see it. If more all the blood will not, remove the blood in the second sitting. I don't remove after seventy two hours. I am not doing anything at that time. I am just. It's a very short surgery. Just a vitrectomy, ILM peel, sub retinal TPA gram extra. I put in the vitreous cavity. That's just my idiosyncrasy. Otherwise, that twenty five microgram. Underneath the retina is fine. Position the patient. Go back after seventy-two hours. Okay. Be really impressed by the results. Great. Both in macroaneurysm and in, uh, but please do this only when there is documented one thousand micron uh, thickness, five hundred micron or six hundred micron. In that those cases. Just do a vitrectomy, and if needed, an ILM peel in a macroaneurysm in PCV, just an injection. Yeah, good. So we'll start with Dr. Gopal. Uh, Gopal Pillai now. I think Gopal can present video separately from I the. Can, from there are questions for you, ma'am, from audience. Yeah. How much TPA uh, do you inject, and what is the cost of uh, TPA? Yeah, TPA. The dose to be injected is twenty-five to fifty micrograms. the cost has now come down it used to be 40000 plus for a 50 mg vial but now even a 25 mg vial is available so that cost yeah. 
around 15000 i as far as exactly 15000 rupees and uh, i have been lucky at times i have done two cases on the same day yeah. using the same wire and sharing it between yeah. them and where do so, you procure it from sorry doctor uh, where do you procure it procure it from there are two three companies it's easily available in any major hospitals because it's used in emergencies for cardiac and stroke acting yeah. laser is available yeah it's comes under the trained name of lt place and like what dr malika said it's now available for a cost of around 15 to 20000 rupees hmm. the dilution is also pretty easy the 25 mg vial comes with the 25 ml fluid so you just need to mix it and you get 0.100 microgram in 1 ml so you just need to take 0.1 ml and then redilute it and you get a dose of 50 microgram which is a safe dose of lt place so the dilution is easy it's pretty easily available and another comment was yeah. the flush needle so deep it's a very good idea to keep it handy in your roti all the time because many times you end up doing a vitrectomy for just yeah what the question another suggestion was the cv and then you want to yeah ma'am another suggestion was like uh, flush needle would uh, would have been useful to the flush the submacular hemorrhage instead of using a cutter back I, back I, i didn't use a cutter i used a flute only with the yeah. active suction on it which was being used as a, with reflux i was using the positive pressure okay. to dislodge the blood and then the aspiration from the flute only okay. cutter was used in the end only for the solid clots Dr. Gopal, are you ready? Gopal. Any more questions, Sandeep, from the audience? That's it, ma'am. All questions are covered. And another uh, question was: Does the size of the bubble matter for displacement in a smaller uh, bubble in cases where we fear that the large hemorrhage will go to the center? So, uh, can I? Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, of course. Dr. Sandeep, is this the size of a bubble, or for a bubble which we are inducing subretinally? If that is the question, no, I yeah, don't. it's not clear. I don't know whether it is. Okay. So, if you are using subretinal TPA, the advantage is we use a thirty-eight or a forty-gauge needle. So, when you create a bubble with a subretinal TPA, you can either just leave it and displace it, and if you put gas, even that will help. But there is one more variation which has been proposed by Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam group, which is, and also Dr. Atul Sir has also had some talks. and there are others also who practice what they do is they along with tpa also inject yeah. air inside it so air yeah. and, and then what that does is it displaces the hemorrhage below the foveal area so that also spaces so you can do both the things you can only either inject subretinal tpa or you can inject tpa along with air we have tried it and we found both of them to be actually equally good i usually i have now around 12 or 13 patients where we have given subretinal tpa And in two of them, I tried putting air along with TPA, and in others we did just both. And both of them have actually worked for us. They work well. Yeah. Air with TPA works very well, and 0.05 ml of yeah. air with the TPA injection subretinal is enough. Yeah. Okay. So, to Gopal Raju, are you ready? In the sec, uh, the HIV patient that I had shown, would anybody else have done differently because the center was involved? So would anybody have done anything different? I just did an anti-vegf. Is better. This, the height of the hemorrhage at the fovea was not much. You did the. Yes. That was absolutely the right approach. Yes. So I didn't know only that would have been the initial way to go. If it did yeah. not improve, subsequently we would have tried. But this was the probably the best course of management. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So Sai is trying to play my videos. Uh, I let me see. Uh, can I know where should I start? Okay. Yeah, I think you can start from the first. Uh, yeah, the fifth slide. The fifth slide. Yeah. So uh, let's see which of which of videos play. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So here, basically, what we are seeing is it is a very thick sclera. and so unless you hold the eye support the eye properly you may end up in a lot of catastrophe let us come to the next slide that is a difficult entry in a uh, end of thalamitis basically there is a hypotony 
this is a very old uh, video so i am using a biplanar entry uh, so this is a very thick choroid and because of the hypotony the wound may also open up that is the basic problem here uh, so we have to use a sharp needle and you have to use vertically okay, next slide um, cannula not uh, fitting with the tubing this occurs a lot when we are uh, reusing the tubings uh, and when we are re-autoclaving and package goes into a wrong pack and can we press on the next video please yeah so uh, if you correct it with a 25 to 25 it easily uh, works now next slide please it's a loose infusion cannula a deadly mistake which completely we should avoid can we uh, is this video playing no the video is not playing okay so if the if you are thinking that the it's a loose infusion cannula you should never keep it remove that infusion cannula place another next slide please uh, will this video play no it's the slide these are slide will this video play yeah yeah so here what has happened is uh, there is a there is an infusion cannula which was in place which we removed and put it in the suprotemporal area and all the ports were shifted superiorly because inferiorly there was a large choroidal detachment now we have injured the ciliary body to create a bleed so the direction of entry should be towards the center and not anterior if any direction of entry problems will be there then there is a problem this uh, the second video shows that we are removing the uh, bleed with the visco and making the media clear and then we have to go in again, find the infusion cannula. In this particular situation, you will have to use a six millimeter large 20 gauge infusion cannula without any shortcuts. Next, it's bleeding from the uh, next video, please, Sai. So it's, uh, yeah, it's bleeding. Uh, is this, will this video move? Yes. Yeah. Very good. So here, this is also again an old one chip video, which shows that there's a bleeding which is occurring right from the infusion cannula area. So if the patient is on like, you can see the blood which is actively dripping from the infusion cannula area. So you need to intent, go there, find out the bleed. Initially, what I would do is I'll keep the 60 millimeters pressure for some time, maybe two or three minutes and see if uh, things settle down with that. Uh, otherwise, you'll have to indent that area, see where you've injured, and probably now you can see that blood is still dripping inside when I move that instrument. Uh, so you'll have to go reach that particular area, diathermize, and uh, uh, diathermize the area of the bleed. Okay, you can see fresh blood coming in. That is the bleed, which is uh, a reason, uh, probably some bleed, some uh, blood vessel in that uh, pars plana region near that particular region, some abnormal blood vessel may have been, may have been there, which would blood. Next slide, visualize the infusion cannula always. When Whenever you put it inside, you have to visualize the, will the first video play? First video doesn't play, Dr. Only. Okay. The second video shows very, uh, yeah, the second video shows very clearly that uh, if you. The second video also doesn't play. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so here, uh, when we are uh, trying to find out the infusion cannula in the vitreous, we are not able to see it. We can use the other instrument to try and tease and try to find out whether it is there. Uh, can you play the second one, uh, the uh, the right one? Yeah, that one. Uh, so, yeah, so you can use the, uh, you can, uh, so you can play all four together. So you have to remove that infusion cannula from that place because we are not seeing the uh, tip of the infusion within the vitreous because of bleed, because of endophthalmitis, because of thick choroid, because of a lot of reasons, it may be because like that. And then uh, the beauty of MIVS is that we can shift it over to another, uh, another port. So you can uh, change from another port. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so here is again another uh, end of thalmitis case in which uh, this with cannula we cannot see. This what we did was, can we play the second video? This uh, what we did was, we had to actually uh, remove, uh, we did not remove that particular cannula. We uh, made another 20 gauge infusion cannula there, which is six millimeters. Now six millimeter um, infusion cannula with, can you see the tip there? Yeah, six millimeter with 25 gauge as well as 23 gauge is available. So it makes a difference. Next slide, please. It's a intraoperative supracoroidal, uh, you know, slippage. Um, yeah. So here there was a case of retinal detachment, 
in which uh, i was uh, doing a vitrectomy and suddenly some brownish pig, uh, color came in the uh, periphery so usually what happens if this, there is a hypotony if there is a suction infusion mismatch there could be some globe collapse and you may see choroidal detachment developing but this was not looking like that so i went there i tried pushing in the cannula which was initially inside but now you what all what you can see is the choroid so it has become supracoroidal so in such a case you need to remove uh, this particular supracoroidal cannula stop the infusion first because it will cause more problem can we go to the next slide so it will cause more problem and uh, there could be supracoroidal effusion also if you uh, continue like that so remove it and uh, bring in the cannula in a place where it is probably seen uh, better okay so can this yeah so again uh, intra operative slippage is you know you have to make another uh, port somewhere else can we have the second video also playing in so i change the infusion cannula from that particular location to another location and uh, then once everything is over probably you make another another port somewhere else because uh, uh, superiorly you will have two of your hands going and one should for illuminator and one for the port so you may have to shift that particular thing to a nasal Uh, uh area later okay next slide so the uh, next slide is a patient where uh, uh, i was doing a retinal detachment surgery it was almost the end of surgery everything was smooth and clean i was just doing the final air fluid exchange and laser and at this point of time uh, this is like you can see that the retina is completely i came out and i wanted to change another instrument i wanted another a uh, little bit of uh, and you can see that everything is black now when i looked again you can see this uh, large choroidal mound there so immediately i understood i removed my so it was under air so it is supracoroidal air which had come in i in changed that infusion cannula to the supranasal port here yeah and then shifted over to fluid and found out inside that there is a supracoroidal air okay so the supracoroidal air unlike fluid floats up and so uh, probably we can uh, remove it through an opening in the superior area next slide please supracoroidal fluid uh, Uh, after iol uh, uh, this was after i this was an sf iol which had uh, fallen down there was a subretinal hemorrhage also you can see that that is the infusion cannula and the uh, iol is dangling very near that uh, ciliary body area because this is a scleral fixated iol so one haptic is very thickly attached so i had to cut that particular haptic and uh, i took the lens out easily and when i went inside again this is what i see and uh, this patient gives a history of supracoroidal uh, hemorrhage during the first cataract surgery and that was why the sfi oil was performed in the first place and the sfi oil fell down and i had to go inside to get it that was what has happened so uh, this patient did not come with my uh, did not tell me that there was a complicated first cataract surgery okay anyway next slide active suction this is the last slide next slide next slide next slide that is uh, active suction for choroidal uh, effusion so this was an intraoperative choroidal effusion which came in and uh, what we did was we had a small uh, uh, you know uh, sclerotomy there and went with active suction inside and uh, with visualization uh, through the inside you can see the you can see the uh, instrument which is there uh, posterior to that and i actively sucked and you can see that the choroidal detachment is completely going this is a one time uh, one or two times i have succeeded like this but uh, two or three times i have completely failed with this technique also so i cannot recommend this this is a small schematic diagram of what would have happened this infusion cannula was there but intraoperatively there was a slippage uh, like that because of uh, mobility so you should always fix the infusion cannula there and fluid came in and uh, that fluid we removed uh, from outside through a sclerotomy with active suction we were able to remove the fluid next slide please so uh, these is these uh, all the slides which i have shown are basically very simple slides uh, initial beginner steps beginners bloopers and beware of the infusion cannula problems decide on the location and placement preoperatively decide on the entry style like in the vertical or uh, something like that and uh, 4 mm versus 6 mm we have to decide fix properly and you know you should fix it otherwise it may just loop assistant should always be watching it because we will get very very uh, tense going inside and looking at bleeders and uh, all those things each time we come out or go in with an instrument make sure that you are not uh, you know uh, entangling your infusion cannula high index of suspicion for any problem and rapid corrective action otherwise a catastrophe may come thank you very much and i'm absolutely sorry for my 
uh, uh, blooper in um, presenting this. Thank you very much, Sai. You can stop share. Very good. Good presentation. Um, very sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. To watch this presentation needs some courage. So, any questions, uh, Sandeep, no, these, these are about 20 years complications put together. <laughs> I hope they're not happening uh, frequently. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> there is one question from audience. Yeah. Uh, can we do cryo at the port site at the end of the surgery if you are not able to localize? Localize what? If you are not able to localize. I mean, I think he meant if you are not able to localize the uh, port inside, can we do a cryo at the site? I don't generally see. I would after after the end of surgery, I would intent. I would see that particular location to see if there is any tear or break. If there are no tears or breaks, I will not do any cryo. Okay. Because I think he meant cryo for a uh, localization blind source. Actually, yeah. If there is a blind source, I will do a cryo. If there is a source of choroidal detachment, then I may consider doing a cryo. The other thing is sometimes very rarely there can be a port side dialysis. So again, in yeah. those cases, it becomes important yeah. to do a cryo. Yeah. yeah. But I think after once we have started using this six mm cannulas, uh, most of these complications with this uh, infusion yeah. cannulas have come down. I had uh, one uh, interesting uh, case of supracoroidal air. So after silicone oil removal, especially this is very common, especially when we use, uh, reuse uh, these uh, disposable uh, cannulas and trocars. And so it can happen. And especially at the end of uh, SOR, uh, he was uh, doing partial fluid air exchange. And suddenly the whole retina has uh, been just behind the lens. So we didn't do anything. I just said anything related to choroid, just spray and close it and we'll see. In one week time, uh, the yeah. air actually comes. My supracoroidal air also settled over the next two, three so, weeks. Only thing is that there is a systemic risk. So people have yeah. uh, reported yeah. in pulmonary caused by the supracoroidal air. Yeah. Yeah. So, so whenever we see this uh, choroidal air, and so that is why very important to always look at the infusion cannula is like our life support, beginning and end. So Sandeep, do you regularly use 6 mm cannula? No, no, not in all cases, ma'am. Where in which you don't find, suppose if I put a 4 mm cannula, if you're not able to visualize, then I shift to a 6 mm cannula. No, I should plan early because uh, the cases of endophthalmitis, thick choroid, UV8 is like Dr. Vaishali was telling, retinal detachment with choroidal detachment. Uh, uh, these are some of the situations where I initially plan to go with a 6 mm cannula. We should also look at where is the choroidal detachment preoperatively so that we can plan the uh, placement of the infusion cannula, which location we should plan, and whether we should go like uh, by planner or straight entry. Always, so, I think always you have to do straight entry in all these thick choroid patients. Yeah. And if you don't have six minute cannula as Sandeep may have, but nowadays six minute cannula is not so easily available also. And uh, I don't have at least, I have only 20 gauge uh, six millimeter. So yeah. either shift there or use AC maintenance. AC maintenance can be used even in fake guys also for uh, short term use and then shift to your regular uh, 4 millimeter. Actually, hypotonicized uh, 20 gauge is the 6 mm cannula is the best yeah. because you yeah. can enter very carefully in traumatic yeah. eyes. But because nowadays it has become something like obsolete system in uh, OT, you tend to go for these uh, 23 gauge. No, especially in endophthalmitis, because even if we are able to place a 6 millimeter 25 or 23 in place, uh, the exudates will block that and the flow will not be good. As you said, uh, if there is some doubt like that, it is better to go into 20 gauge 6 millimeter cannula rather than anything else. In end of, I think that works the best. You see, even when sometimes you are depressing, na? so if there is a cannula which is precariously placed, especially in a patient who has RD with CD and you want to do some base dissection and yeah. somebody is indenting, sometimes this cannula may become supra. Supracoroidal. Yeah. yeah, at any step during the surgery, it can become supracoroidal. Yeah. So, Somebody, is, uh, one of the assistants should be told to really keep an eye on that. <laughs> That's a luxury at times. <laughs> you need to be careful with the 6mm cannulas because it can, uh, in fake patients, especially yeah. if it does the lens. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Especially if you're intending those patients. Yeah. So I think uh, with this, we will um, close. And I thank Sai for uh, uh, being my uh, helpline. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to thank our guest faculty, Dr. Verma, Dr. Vishali Gupta, Dr. Shobit Chavla, and Dr. Gopal Pillai.
for their uh, participation and all our host faculty who have been patient and kept their um, times. And a special thanks to uh, Mr. Sai for his professionalism, sending out emails and uh, troubleshooting. And to Allergan for supporting this meeting, not only financially, but also with a lot of support, technological and other promotional support. So with this, uh, we meet again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always uh, participating in your conferences, uh, learning for both audience as well as for the panel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, Malika's uh, theme of cases and cases because uh, then you are glued. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you tend to you know sometimes uh, slip off. But cases and cases, you want to hear everything. Yeah. Chuck, thanks a lot. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the bloopers. No See some videos of Sandeep okay. uh, maybe next time. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.